arriving at the airbase. That news coming to us via Israeli media. Well, in return, Israel will release 39 Palestinians from its prisons. A further 12 Thai hostages were released by the terror group a short time ago following mediation efforts by Egypt. That news was confirmed by the Prime Minister of Thailand. Well, a temporary pause in the fighting between Israel and Hamas came into force this morning, which is expected to last for four days. We will, of course, keep you updated on this story. 34 people have been arrested after riots and violent scenes in Dublin yesterday. A clean-up was underway this morning in the city centre after cars were set alight and shops were looted. A number of police officers were also injured. The violence was sparked after three children and a woman were stabbed close to a school in the city yesterday. A five-year-old girl is said to be in a serious condition. Taoiseach Leo Varadkar said the people involved in the unrest brought shame on the country. Those involved brought shame on Dublin, brought shame on Ireland and brought shame on their families and themselves. These criminals did not do what they did because they love Ireland. They did not do what they did because they wanted to protect Irish people. They did not do it out of any sense of patriotism however warped. They did so because they're filled with hate. They love violence, they love chaos, and they love causing pain to others. Oscar Pistorius will be freed from prison on parole in January, nearly 11 years after killing his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, on Valentine's Day in 2013. The former Paralympic champion, who is now 37, claimed he fired the gun through a bathroom door after mistaking his partner for an intruder, saying he feared for his safety. He was initially jailed for five years, but an appeal saw him sent back for six years in 2016, less than half of the 15-year minimum term that had been sought by prosecutors. Nissan has announced a £1.2 billion plan to build electric versions of two new cars at his Sunderland plant. The Japanese automaker's new electric Qashqai and Jeep models will be manufactured at the site. It's also expected to bring wider investment in the industry, including the construction of a new gigafactory to make more batteries. Rishi Sunak is facing a backlash from senior members of his own party after new figures revealed migration is at an all-time high. Reports suggest MPs are demanding action to reduce the number of people coming legally to the UK. Net migration peaked at 745,000 last year, a record high. Work and Pensions Secretary Mel Stride says measures to reduce the number are already in place. We accept that the figures are too high and that's why, for example, recently we announced that in the case of 150,000 student visas, we'd be clamping down on them, uh, bringing uh, dependents in uh, with them. We're putting up the cost of uh, visas, uh, a number of different measures. And the OBR, who are the independent forecasters uh, who look at the kind of impacts of these steps, recognise that this will uh, in itself start to bring uh, the level of migration down. But there is more to be done. And a familiar face is returning to London's Oxford Street as music shop HMV reopens its doors. The historic retailer returns today after a four-year absence, reclaiming its old flagship location in what's hoped to be a boost for the popular shopping strip. GB News reporter Ray Addison is there. His return to profit means that new owner Doug Putnam has been able to reopen the brand's flagship store four years after it shut down here on Oxford Street. He's going to be hoping that it can once again become a mainstay of the high street. Now, over the years, influential acts such as Michael Jackson, the Spice Girls and the Beatles, no less, have all performed here. It's also been used as an air raid shelter in World War II and burnt to the ground and been rebuilt. Now it'll have to survive the tough economic conditions as many shoppers tighten their belts. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now it's back to Martin. Thank you, Tamsin. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me this Friday afternoon. Now, we start with the news we broke in the last hour. Hamas has released several hostages after a four-day ceasefire with Israel came into force. Twelve are Thai nationals. Israeli media is reporting that 13 Israeli hostages have also been transferred to Egypt. Well, our home and security editor, Mark White, joins us now in the studio for an update. Mark, the moment many were just praying would come, um, there is a momentary ceasefire. What's the latest? 
Well, it's very precarious, of course, not just the truce, but the whole transfer of hostages from a terrorist group uh, to the Red Cross, uh, eventually on to the Israeli military. Um, that's underway. We understand the latest news that we're getting out of Israeli media is that these hostages, the Israeli hostages, have been handed over to the International Red Cross. It's within Gaza, an undisclosed location. Clearly, from Hamas's point of view, they were trying to insist on lots of security safeguards. There's drones overhead that the Israelis would have and, and alike. We don't know how far Israel has acquiesced to those demands yeah. from Hamas. Anyway, they've got satellites in the sky far above that are pretty good at imaging what's happening on the ground. But, as I say, we understand, according to Israeli media, that the, those 13 Israeli hostages are now in the care of the International Red Cross and making their way to the Rafa border. So that's the southern border of the Gaza Strip, into Egypt. bordering Egypt into the Sinai Peninsula. And do we know if they are women and children? Because that was the demand of the Israeli authorities, the, the kind of preference was for that. Do you know any detail at all about who the individuals are? Well, we know that we're expecting women and children to be released yeah. today because that's what we've been told by the Israeli government. Uh, but we won't know, of course, mm. until we actually have those that have been transferred across the border. We should say, in addition to those 13 Israeli nationals, we have 12 Thai citizens that were kidnapped as well on the 7th of October. Now, these Thais were uh, working, migrant workers working in the agriculture industry down on uh, some of the kibbutz when Hamas carried out their terrorist attack and took them hostage. That is part, apparently, of uh, a separate negotiation that has taken place that the Egyptians handled, mm. uh, negotiations with Hamas that secured the release uh, of these 12 Thai nationals. The Thai Prime Minister has confirmed that they have now been released. They are in the process of being brought to safety at the same time as the 13 Israelis. And it's hoped, Martin, that over the course of the next few days, 50 uh, Israelis mm. um, will be brought to safety, will be released by Hamas. But remember, 240 at least mm. is the number of hostages that Hamas has been holding. And this comes with caveats, of course. Um, the word was is for every 10 hostages released, there'd be a, a day of ceasefire. Of course, aid is going in. But also, there's some horse trading going on. The Palestinians have demanded 39 detainees held in Israeli jails or released in return. Presumably, these are characters that the Israelis would rather keep in jail. And, in fact, we have seen previous instances of Palestinian detainees being released and going on to commit further terrorist offences against Israel. Well, of course, it's always a risk and it's very unpalatable. Mm. And Israel is holding its nose. Um, and, you know, just having to deal with what's in front of them, mm. they need to get these hostages released. Um, and the release of... 39 Palestinians, some of them convicted terrorists, is not something they want to do. But if it secures the release of these innocent members of the public who were taken hostage by Hamas on the 7th of October, then they will do, do that and they'll have to deal with the potential consequences mm -hmm. of releasing convicted terrorists back into the community again. Um, we, we should say that in, in terms of the way that this is supposed to work after the next few days. So 13 Israelis being released today, then over the next three days, a similar amount, yes. with a total of about 50 uh, over a period of four days. And while that f four days of release activity is taking place, there will be a truce that it's hoped will hold. But these things are always very fragile. And a mistake by any side here could break down that truce. Um, and after the uh, 50 or so hostages have been released, you will still be left with about 200-odd yeah. who are being held hostage. The hope is that over the coming 20 or so days, that 10 hostages a day will be released. And the truce, according to the Israelis, 
will hold for each day that 10 hostages are released. So we could actually have a prolonged period uh, of a cessation of violence in the Gaza Strip. It's, a, it's quite a change of position because Netanyahu initially was very brazen, saying he wouldn't stop until Hamas had been wiped out, that hostages would be retrieved by IDF ground forces going in and physically pulling them out. Do you think Joe Biden getting involved in this has had an influence? Um, he was asking for a, a softer approach, a more negotiation-based approach. And, of course, the great fear is that with every day of ceasefire, it will allow Hamas to regroup. Nevertheless, this is a necessity. I think it's, you know, a dynamic and fluid assessment as far as Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet are concerned. We should say that Benjamin Netanyahu uh, and also the Defence Minister, other members of the war cabinet, are in the command centre at the moment overseeing and monitoring the release of these hostages. But initially, of course, they wanted to go in uh, and put pressure on Hamas. There was a period, remember, in the days after the 7th of October attacks where an American woman and her daughter were released and then a couple of weeks later uh, we had another two Israeli elderly women that were released and then nothing. And Egypt made the assessment that actually those talks had stalled and that Hamas was just playing for time. So that fed in to their decision-making in terms of starting the ground war. They wanted to ratchet up the pressure on Hamas and also see whether they could rescue hostages, and they did do that. One female That's Israeli right. member of the IDF they managed to rescue in an operation during their push into the Gaza Strip, but then, of course, nothing in the weeks after that. So the, the negotiations were continuing behind the scenes, obviously Qatar playing a part, uh, and then also Egypt and some of the Gulf states playing a part as well in the negotiations. And we understand it's two separate negotiations, one that Egypt has managed to broker to get the 12 Thai nationals released, yes. and then another set of negotiations that the Qataris were responsible for that uh, has also then, we believe, led to the release of 13. Israel TV now saying that the hostages uh, are meeting Israeli officials on Egyptian soil mm. as we speak. So it seems that the hostages have crossed over from Gaza into the safety of Egypt, and they are now meeting with Israeli officials. That's fantastic news. And we can go to pictures here, live pictures, uh, for those of you who can't see them on radio. Um, these are live pictures from the Offer prison in Israel, where Palestinian prisoners are expected to be released in exchange, Mark, for those Israeli hostages. So those are live pictures of the prison where the Israelis or the Palestinian uh, prisoners, beg your pardon, are being held. So very much a live exchange situation. The prisoners coming out in, in, in exchange for the hostages coming from Palestine. And that's live pictures there at the Rafa crossing. It appears to be vehicles, Mark, moving towards the Egyptian side from Palestine. So presumably that may be some of the first convoy of hostages. Well, it could be. Um, that looks like it uh, certainly there is activity there on the Rafa crossing at the moment. Um, so those officials, uh, including intelligence officials from Shin Bet, uh, the Israeli secret service, mm. are meeting those um, hostages to debrief them, to speak to them initially. Uh, they, there, there have been centres that have been set up initially where these hostages can be taken to. Remember, the plan is that some of the hostages will be children. Yeah. Um, there's soft toys and things like that, just to help them. God knows what kind of ordeal mm. uh, these little ones have been through uh, over recent weeks and what the conditions were like down in those tunnel systems. And remember, many of them will be without parents, parents possibly murdered in the attacks as well. So not just physically, mm. but psychologically, they could be in a terrible state. So it will be a delicate process of just dealing with these hostages, first of all, speaking to them, gaining from the intelligence side of things as much as they can initially, uh, while assessing them medically and psychologically as much as they can do at this stage, then getting them onto these helicopters 
uh, for a trip to probably Tel Aviv because uh, when we had the release on the 23rd of October uh, of Mo uh, Nurit Cooper and Jokovic Lipsic, they were taken to hospital in Tel Aviv initially and assessed there by medics in, in one of the main hospitals in central Tel Aviv. So it's likely that will happen as well. So they'll be physically assessed, obviously, psychologically assessed. They have been through a huge, huge trauma. Heaven knows what they've been through in those tunnels, in the complexes within Palestine, within the Gaza area. Um, and also, presumably, they, they will be questioned by the intelligence services as to what they know, what they've seen. And then, of course, there'll be a huge global public interest in, in their human stories. So the days ahead are going to be absolutely fascinating and key to watch. I think that's a bus that looked as though it was in shot there, the Rafa crossing. Um, there certainly looks as though there's convoys of vehicles. Um, it's possible as well, remember, that what is also happening at the Rafa crossing, because we've got this truce, because the crossing is open, uh, in to a fashion anyway, and um, we're getting aid trucks that are crossing yeah. over into Gaza as well, 200 mm -hmm. trucks each day, uh, with among them fuel trucks for the first time, with 130,000 litres of fuel each day to go into the Gaza Strip to the aid agencies there and to be passed on to the likes of the hospitals um, and the desalination plants and alike in, in the Gaza Strip as well. So there looks to be um, a convoy of vehicles there. It might be a bus um, yeah. that we can see just parked up and shot with other vehicles behind it with orange flashing lights. So that may well be the hostages having being initially assessed, uh, being then taken away there to uh, their helicopter. It would seem perhaps a bit sudden for that to happen. I don't know how long they would be assessed in this mm -hmm. centre. It's only speculation on our part, and I guess it depends what those officials find in terms of the condition that the hostages are in. OK, Mark White, thanks for that analysis. We'll have lots more on this developing story throughout the show, of course, and there's plenty of coverage on our website. GBnews.com, you've helped to make it the fastest-growing national news website in the country. So thanks to all of you for doing that. Now, the Republic of Ireland's Premier says the hundreds of people involved in violent scenes in Dublin last night brought shame on the country. We'll analyse that after, the, after this, I'm Martin Daubney on GB News and we are Britain's News Channel. Who is it? We're here for the show. <laughs> Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 3.24. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, in a few minutes, find out why Rishi Sunak is under yet more pressure from Tory MPs. And I'll bring you an apology from Jacob Rees-Mogg. But now to the fallout from last night's riots in Dublin. After the Republic of Ireland's Premier says the hundreds of people involved in violent scenes brought shame on the country. 34 people were arrested in riots that saw buses and trams burned, shops looted and several police vehicles damaged. The violence was triggered by a knife attack on three school children and their care assistant outside a school in the city centre yesterday lunchtime. Well, let's cross now to Dublin and speak to our reporter, Doogie Beatty. Doogie, um, for those of us who've been watching the political landscape in, uh, in Ireland, and particularly in Dublin for the last year, um, there's been a certain sense of inevitability of the area feeding like something of a powder keg. The island is full movement, huge dissatisfaction from the local working class community due to the fact they felt that thousands of refugees were being forced upon them with no consultation. Do you think yesterday's tragic stabbings was the inevitable spark that lit that tinderbox? Well, I don't know about being an inevitable spark, but definitely this has been boiling under the surface for quite some time. In fact, I reported on it about a year ago in a place called the East Wall. It's not that far away from where I'm standing now. And it's those working class areas, those, uh, as we would call them, the dubbers, uh, the, the real Dubliners um, that, that have been based, on, and their communities have taken the most amount of immigrants into them, because obviously in, in any major city and Dublin is truly a massive European city uh, in Ireland and it has took an awful amount of immigrants in in this last couple of years. Now the Ukrainians that came here uh, they have been fleeing war and you know I spent a bit of time in the Crimea a short while ago and you know Ukrainians way of life is actually very similar to uh, Britain in a whole you know I mean they're morally the same it is a beautiful country uh, and most of the people that arrive uh, from Ukraine, you will find that they are doing exactly what that is meant to do for refugees. They are fleeing war, most of them being women and children. That is never denied. And in fact, Dublin doesn't deny people coming into uh, the city either. What the, the locals really do want is more security checks. They want uh, more housing for themselves. You've got quite a waiting list in Dublin, probably about four years for a house here. And, you know, all of this is playing into the hands of those working classes. And those working classes used to work in factories. They used to work in the docks. They were very down-to-earth people. And they feel that they haven't been listened to. So was this a spark last night? Uh, probably you could, you could probably argue that that was the last straw for them to, uh, because at the time in the press conferences, um, the uh, commissioner of the Garda Chiacana 
didn't deny or accept that this was an Irish national that had, well, had suspected of carrying out this attack. We must say that this young five-year-old uh, that is uh, still in a very critical condition in Temple Street, just, just up the road from here, and Mary Lou MacDonald, who's the leader of Sinn Féin, just a short time ago, she spoke to the press, and she was calling for the resignation of Helen McAtee, the Justice Minister, and that of Drew Harris, the Commissioner of the Garda Shiakana. But last night here, the Garda Shiakana did do a, a very effective job in, in putting down what was a very serious situation. Within about three hours, they managed to corral the uh, protesters into different streets and divide and conquer, I suppose, as they went in when they threw a ring of steel round the city. But I spoke to one of the local residents last night, and here's what he had to say. Right, so what happened here today was uh, kids were stabbed in a school. Um, one of them was my friend's kid. Um, it's live, thank God. Uh, then people came in to have a, well, I, I thought it would be a peaceful protest in the city centre at the Spire tonight, but obviously it didn't. There was a lot of people here when I arrived early, about half five, and there was carnage. There was They were angry, they were upset. There was women, children, they were just men angry with the police about what happened. Um, and then it just went out of hand. Police cars ended up on fire. Lewis ended up on fire. Bus ended up on fire. Shops were looted. Um, it was just carnage on O'Connell Street and all down O'Connell Street up onto the bridge. It, um, guards, what were they... The guards came with like them um, visor stuff and they were uh, the, the shields and they were fighting with the people with the, they were hitting people and it was just scuffles everywhere. It was just bottles throwing rockets like uh, fire rockets, you know, like um, fireworks. And it was just carnage. It's a horrible thing to see in my city. I've never seen anything like it before, dog in my life. Well, you could hear from that local resident, there is anger in amongst the community. And most of these problems are exactly the same problems that they're having, not only across UK, but the whole way across Europe. And it's really to do with infrastructure and not enough of it uh, to cope with the amount of people that's coming in. Instead of growing your population and the infrastructure at the same time, that isn't happening. OK, Doogie Beatty, thank you for that update live from Dublin. Well, I'm joined now by Kevin Marr, who's an author and a commentator on Irish politics. Good afternoon. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Always Hello. a pleasure. Um, we heard from a local resident there in Dublin um, who said it was carnage on the streets last night. I wanted to ask you, though, about the reaction of Leo Varadka. Um, he made a statement this afternoon, and he seemed to turn his anger not on the perpetrator of the crime, but on the residents of Dublin. He called them cowardly chaplains, um, saying that most people are afraid of you, your anger, your hate, and how you blame others for your problems. Um, he called the rioters criminals filled with hate. Do you think, considering the situation, we just heard of some of the political backdrop, how there's great dissatisfaction from locals, do you think that's the right thing for Varadkar to have said? I think it's a predictable response because Leo Varadka is, like a lot of European politicians, he is uh, very liberal. Um, the party he leads, Fianna Gael, is, is a kind of David Cameron Tory party. Um, they're very socially liberal, economically liberal. They've ignored um, a lot of the, the social and economic problems um, in the Republic of Ireland. I mean, I Ireland is a, is a bit of a paradox. Economically, it's doing incredibly well. Um, it, it, its tax receipts are overflowing. Jeremy Hunt looks on enviously, I've no doubt. But there are a lot of problems with housing. There are a lot of problems with um, dilapidation in, in those traditional communities. As Dougie was mentioning a few minutes ago, that his government has presided over and done very little about. Now, the problem that, that's, that's taken place really in Ireland in the last decade is that a million migrants there or thereabouts have come and settled in Ireland over the last decade. It's been a massive social change very, very quickly and typically, like in Britain and like lots of other European countries, done without the consent, the electoral consent of the Irish people. And it's created a very big backlash. And, and you know, quite rightly, as, as Dougie was pointing out, over the course of the last year or 18 months, there have been a lot of 
uh, disturbances, there have been a lot of protests, there's, there's been a lot of anger. And on this occasion, it's spilled over into the, into, into the writing that we've seen. Now, you know, you have to say immediately that all those people on the streets attacking Irish police officers were not necessarily making a sophisticated political point when they broke into sports shops to nick expensive trainers. But, but there is an awful lot of frustration there because Ireland is changing very, very rapidly. 20% of its resident population is now foreign born. Now, that is higher than Britain at about 15%, and it is higher even than the United States of America, that great melting pot, mm. at about 14%. The comparator really is Sweden, got exactly the same uh, the same percentage of its population that's, that's foreign born. You know, and as we can see in Sweden, there are all kinds of social and problems emanating from the communities that, that have settled there. And Sweden, peaceful Sweden, now has the highest gun murder rate in the European Union. Okay, so, so, so I just change very fast, but without consent, and that's the big problem. OK, Kevin Moore, we're going to have to leave it there. Great analysis. Thank you very much for joining us on GB News. There's loads more still to come between now and 4 o'clock in a few minutes. I'll tell you why Jacob Rees-Mogg has had to issue an apology. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Tamsin Roberts. Martin, thanks very much. Here are the headlines at 3.33. Well, first, some breaking news. The first group of Israeli hostages have been released by the Hamas terror group and are now in Egypt. Well, these pictures are coming to us live from the Hatzerim Air Base in Israel. It's understood that the hostages have entered Egypt via the Rafa crossing a short time ago and will soon arrive at the air base. That news coming to us via uh, Israeli media. Well, we can also take you to the Ofa prison in Israel. Uh, in return for the release of those hostages, Israel will release 39 Palestinians from its prisons. Well, a further 12 Thai hostages were released by the terror group a short time ago. That was following mediation efforts by Egypt, and that news was confirmed by the Prime Minister of Thailand. And it's understood more may be released in the coming days. Well, a temporary pause in the fighting between Israel and Hamas came into force this morning, which is expected to last for four days. So that's the latest uh, from Israel. We will, of course, bring you more on this as we get it throughout the afternoon. To other news now, 34 people have been arrested after riots and violent scenes in Dublin yesterday. A clean-up was underway this morning in the city centre after cars were set alight and shops were looted. A number of police officers were also injured. The violence was sparked after three children and a woman were stabbed close to a school in the city. A five-year-old girl is said to be in a serious condition. Taoiseach Leo Varadkar said people involved in the unrest brought shame on the country. Nissan has announced a £1.2 billion plan to build electric versions of two new cars at its Sunderland plant. The Japanese automaker's new electric Qashqai and Duke models will be manufactured at the site, which is expected to protect jobs and generate new employment in the sector. Well, those are the top stories. You can get more on all of those headlines. Just visit our website, gbnews.com. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Let's take a quick look at today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2613 and €1.1526. The price of gold is £1,588.28 per ounce and the FTSE 100 is at 7,483 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Tamsin. Well, Rishi Sunak is under yet more pressure from angry Tory MPs after yesterday's record net migration figures. They revealed that the population of the UK increased by almost three quarters of a million last year. Suella Bradman said the figures were a slap in the face to the British public and they prompted Jacob Rees-Mogg to say sorry on his GB News show yesterday evening. First of all, an apology. Along with many other Tory MPs, I stood in 2010 on a manifesto to cut migration to the tens of thousands. We have failed and it is now cumulatively in the millions. 
we have failed. Well, I'm joined now by our political correspondent, Catherine Forster. Catherine, a dramatic um, apology from Jacob Rees-Mogg. I am sorry, we have failed elsewhere. The new Conservatives said it's do or die, Miriam Cakes and Danny Kruger. And everywhere you look, there's carnage. A telegraph today saying the betrayal of the British people is complete. It's a fresh day and it's a fresh immigration nightmare for the Conservatives. Yes, absolutely. We talk a lot about small boats, don't we, and the government's attempts to stop those, which they're not doing a great job of. But I think perhaps even more significant is this total failure to control legal migration, because, of course, this is a government that spent many years saying they would get net migration down to the tens of thousands. Boris Johnson, in 2019, said in the Tory manifesto that numbers would come down. At the time, it was about 230,000. And who would have thought when people voted for Brexit in 2016 to take back control of our borders, amongst other things, that um, the result would be that not only did the numbers not fall, but actually tripled to, to three quarters of a million. And just to put this into context, it's completely unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this before. Go back a couple of hundred years. People generally were leaving. In fact, we were a net exporter of people till about the 1980s. Then with new Labour, the numbers started to go up, a couple of hundred thousand a year, up and up to 300,000 all these pledges to bring it down. But make no mistake, while we were within the EU, there was only so much we could do because of free movement. But since we've left, these numbers are the, the directly because of choices that the government have made. OK, Ukrainians, Hong Kong refugees, um, that's transitory, of course. Huge numbers of students great for the education sector, um, and huge numbers of workers now filling gaps in the NHS in social care. We know there's a crisis in social care, but of course a lot of people will say we've got over five million people in this country on out-of-work benefits. In cities like Glasgow, like Liverpool and Birmingham, 20% of the working age population are actually on benefits. Why on earth are we bringing people in and not training our own people and getting them back to work? So I think uh, the government are have, going to have to do something very dramatic between now and the next election. But it's not that clear that they really want to or indeed they can because they've had 13 years. Well, that's a great point, because it's one thing to focus on small boats, and, you know, that's f fair enough. They're, they're tangible. You can see it. It's blatantly and provably unfair. However, this isn't through the cat flap. This is holding open the front door. It's almost rolling out the red carpet. The government is issuing visas in record amounts, has the power to not do so. It just chooses to not do so. And the numbers coming in legally dwarf those coming in illegally. So it's not a case of losing control, is it? It's a case of not wanting to even control it in the first place. Well, it would certainly seem that way, and certainly there are tensions within government. The Home Office also obviously wants to get the numbers down, so we've had very tough words from former Home Secretary Soella Braverman, from the Home Secretary before her, Priti Patel. But other departments within government, the Education Department, they're very happy to have hundreds of thousands of students coming, putting their money into UK universities. And, of course, the Health Department, they need... Workers, they've got a huge skill shortage. If you're a worker in social care, frankly, you can get more money by going and getting a job in your local supermarket. It's a tough job. So you can understand why certain departments really want the numbers. But overall, the Conservatives have pledged over and over again to get these numbers down. Not only have they not done that, but the numbers have tripled on their watch. OK, Catherine Forster, thank you for the update. I wonder what you think out there about this, because we just hear so many platitudes, don't we? We hear so many kind of um, apologies, and I just wonder if, if any of it resonates anymore. It just feels like government... That, it's not just about taking back control. I just don't... It feels like they don't even care. Let me know what you think. Anyway, it's Black Friday when retailers slash prices in an effort to boost trade ahead of Christmas. But has their plan worked, or is it just a load of old hype? I'm Austin Daubney on GB News and this is Britain's News Channel.
We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you... <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's your new teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's a quarter to four. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News at four o'clock. We'll have the latest from Israel after Hamas released 25 hostages this afternoon. We've got live footage from the Rafa crossing, as you can see on screen there. Now, today is Black Friday, the official day to start your Christmas shopping, or so they tell us, as retailers across the UK promote their latest sales and discounts but shoppers are expected to significantly rein in their spending this year as the cost of living crisis takes its toll. Well, to find out if that's true or not, let's go live now to GB News reporter Ray Addison, who's in Oxford Street in central London, and also north of the border, we've got Tony Maguire, who's in Glasgow. First, Ray, um, today used to be the day where we were like, it was like something like a zombie apocalypse. We'd all be trying to fight for a flat screen TV or a new gift for Christmas. This year feels like a bit of a damp squib, or am I just being a bit bar humbug? You tell me. 
Yeah, I think rumours of the apocalypse are uh, perhaps uh, overrated. Certainly no signs of that here today. I got here very early in the morning, just for uh, 7.30, and it was eerily quiet. I did think there was a few people maybe queuing up. Uh, maybe we've seen traditionally people going as early as sort of 4 a.m. and sleeping outside the store. Um, however, there was absolutely no sign of that. It did start to get a little bit busier, though, uh, through the day. It kind of uh, does indicate that perhaps people are choosing to shop more online so um, analysts will be able to tell us later on when they see those sorts of figures of course uh, one retailer was telling me that th today does actually feel busier than it would normally do on a Friday more like a Saturday he said but not like a, a Black Friday as we would come to know it uh, certainly no sign of sort of uh, madness uh, and bargain hunting well I say no madness but uh, behind me uh, we had the HMV opened by the pop band madness and it closed down in 2019 and perhaps we can take its reopening uh, now four years later as a sign that things on the high street are starting to develop a little bit of course uh, they wouldn't be doing that unless they thought there was going to be enough footfall um, the the owners the new owners were hoping that there'd be a big enough crowd to um, shut down the street that didn't quite happen uh, although um, they obviously believe that there's enough uh, potential in interest to bring this store back. It's a brand that's been around for over a hundred years. Lots of young people though saying to me, asking me the question, what is HMV? I've never heard of it. So they'll have to work on their brand awareness, Martin. <laughs> totally agree. HMV, madness. Next up, we're trying to flog us some dealy boppers. OK, let's go north of the border now to Tony Maguire. Tony, you're outside John Lewis, as I understand it. John Lewis, um, they've had their own difficulties. As I understand it, Tony, they're now branching out into healthcare to try and tempt people through the shop door. What's all that about? Yeah, that's correct. Certainly, John Lewis is now looking for ways to bring more shoppers into the store by teaming up with Randox Health. They're a, a diagnostics company that's going to help members of the public diagnose such things as vitamin deficiencies and hormone imbalance and hopefully, as time goes on, allow more people to more choice to, to kind of do these health things in stores. Now, they're going to come up against some stiff competition because Boots and Superdrug, they already offer a range of offers in their stores. But certainly in the first six months of this year, John Lewis, well, they were down about £58 million. Now, they'll be looking to open the first store in December, the first clinic in High Wycombe, and then later on in Blue Water and um, other around the store. None in Scotland, but today, certainly, I was talking to a lot of shoppers in and around Buchanan Street, which you can see behind me, and I was so keen because it's the question that burns everyone's lips year after year. Why shop in town? as opposed to online. Going into town to shop is a lot better compared to online stuff because if you're going into a physical shop, you can actually see the products that you want to buy. Online. And why, why is that? Well, it's just a lot easier when <laughs> they deliver it to your home and you don't have to mix all these people. How are you getting no bags today? No bags, no bags. Got them all online. Yeah. Well, I like to see what I'm getting. I don't like looking online, so, you know, I like to see what I'm buying. It's a tactile experience for yes, you? Yes, yes. And myself, get all my Christmas shopping done. That's it. Done and dusted. You get to see, like, the items um, rather than online. You can't see anything. Good bargains. <laughs> Senior citizens like Jean can you do online shopping. <laughs> but I think it's better coming in the shops and seeing the people and keeping our shops open. So we learned three things really from those chats with the public. One, someone really needs to help Jean work out online shopping. It's been long enough. Two, men particularly don't really like talking about shopping even on Black Friday. And three, there are still plenty of people who want to come into town and do their shopping ahead of Christmas. OK, Tony Maguire, thank you there from Glasgow. If you want my opinion, forget about putting health facilities in stores. Put a man crush in, or as I call it, a pub. That's what we want. We, we can sit there and we can have a couple of bevies while the missus shops around. Call me retrograde. That's what I think the high street needs. Now, thanks, guys. Moving on.
That's good news for the northeast of England today. Nissan has announced the production of three new electric car models, securing 6,000 jobs. The Prime Minister and the Chancellor were both at Nissan's Sunderland plant today. The company is the only car maker in the UK with a dedicated battery plant near to its car plant. Rishi Sunak says a £3 billion investment is great news. Delighted to be here in Sunderland at the Nissan plant to celebrate the fact that Nissan and its partners are tripling their investment in the UK to £3 billion. This is our largest car plant. Its future is safeguarded, protecting thousands of jobs and also transitioning to new electric vehicles. So it's a huge vote of confidence in the UK and in our automotive industry. And it's great in advance of the Global Investment Summit that we are hosting on Monday, where we will be hosting over 200 business and investment leaders from around the world, all of whom are going to be talking about committing to the UK because it's a fantastic place to do business. Companies like Nissan and are demonstrating that today, protecting and creating jobs across the supply chain. So it's, it's great news. Great news for brand Britain, is it? Well, joining me now is James Court, who's the CEO of the Electric Vehicle Association England. Thanks for joining us on the show today, James. So great news. You know, three billion quid investment, thousands of jobs. Where's the bad bit? There is no bad bit. And I think this goes to show, I think, when you're trying to prepare uh, an economy for the future, that putting green jobs right at the heart of it can really pay dividends. The UK automotive base would have no future if it wasn't for electric vehicles. We could be the last country to produce uh, petrol and diesel uh, as the rest of the world embraces EVs. So this really puts us on a firm footing, and I hope that we can sort of drive this forward. The big thing, drive it forward, I like it. The big thing is demand. So how do we tempt more people to get behind the wheel of electric vehicles? There is resistance. People don't have the money. In fact, people oftentimes feel more there's more stick than carrots to get us to go EV. And they're still concerned about things like range and affordability and the time it takes to charge them. So we need significant technological advancements, don't we? Presumably, that's what a new plan like this is going to try and drive forward. And that's the point. And I think the cost of, let's say, the upfront cost, the sticker price, what you go into the forecourt and pay. Mm. EVs and petrol and diesels, hopefully the inflection point, the point where that crosses over, will be in about 2027. Until then, for most people, they buy third-hand and fourth-hand cars. Mm. A lot of EVs at the moment have only been around for two, three years. They're beginning to go into the second-hand car market. But the vast majority of normal people drive third, fourth-hand cars, and we're a good six, seven, eight years away from trying to get people into EVs, which is a shame because they're nicer to drive, they're quieter, and they're cheaper to run. So we actually trying to focus on how we can get people into second-hand, third-hand cars uh, is vitally important. And what's your position on rowing back on the banning, the, the obsolescence of petrol and diesel vehicles, which governments seem hell-bent on doing? A lot of people, again, feel that there's more stick than carrot there. People want the choice. Is choice something we shouldn't have? Should we be universally driving towards electric vehicles, or is that a bit unfair? I think it is unfair, and I think where we got to with the ZEV mandate is that this is something that car companies have had to be a little bit led by the nose to try and ditch before uh, they would want to petrol and diesel cars. They want to try and recoup all they can from their investment they put into petrol and diesel cars, and we need to get going forward quickly with EVs. So, yes, manufacturers did need to be dragged a little bit. The key thing for your viewers is that you will still be able to drive a petrol and diesel car well into the 2040s. For most people, this is not going to impact them. Until they start soon. to change the laws, because they normally do, don't they? They change the laws around, around, the, about, around the Toyota Prius. First of all, that was exempt from road tax and congestion charge in London. And then when a load of people bought them, they changed the rules. The road tax rule is being changed from 2025 on EVs. Anyway, I digress. How talismanic is Nissan to brand UK to the business um, community in the UK. Because we were told, hate to bring up Brexit, but we were told by key Romanians like Alistair Campbell, if we leave, Nissan leaves. But that didn't happen. Nissan stayed, and now this, this huge investment shows that there's confidence in brand Britain. I mean, it shows what government policy can do. And I think the message that we got back from the OEMs and this country got back at the OEMs is that you need the stable policy framework, which is why the ZEV mandate, uh, which was the 2035 ban, has been so important. It gives companies the confidence to invest in UK. That's great. Thanks for joining us. James Court, always a pleasure. Now, Hamas has released 25 hostages on the first day of a four-day hostage ceasefire with Israel. 
And that's fantastic news. We have live images of that coming up from the Rafa crossing and also dramatic images from the prison where Palestinian prisoners are being released in exchange for those prisoners and the aid convoys are going in. We'll have Mark White all across this. This is the moment people have been waiting for. The stories they tell, the, the intel they give us will be key. I'm Martin Dalby on GB News and we are Britain's News Channel. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests, and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's four o'clock. I'm Martin Dorby. Welcome to GB News. Loads coming up in the next hour. Top story, we'll have We'll have dramatic footage from the Rafa crossing as the first of those 240 hostages that Hamas took on October the 7th are released. 13 Israelis now making their way to the border in exchange for 39 Palestinian prisoners. We'll have a full update and live images from that top story. Next coming up, 
Last night we saw riots in Dublin, 34 arrested, hundreds rampage, shops looted and trams, buses and police cars set on fire after a man stabbed five people, including three children. We'll look at the story behind the story. What really caused the tinderbox behind those riots been bubbling away for over a year now? We'll have the full inside story. Next story. Another Tory migration row. Jacob Rees-Mogg dramatically apologised last night on GB News for the Conservatives failing to take back control. The new Conservative movement today saying it's do or die time. But is it simply too late? Have the Tories lost their way? Will you vote for them? Have they simply surrendered on immigration? And finally, tears of a crown. Scobie book is coming out and there are yet more fresh revelations. This time that King Charles feared for the mental health of his son, Prince Andrew. That's all coming up in the next hour. So Jacob Rees-Mogg said sorry last night on GB News for those staggering immigration numbers, 672,000. But is that enough? Are you listening to apologies or are you simply through with the Tories? They said they take back control every general election since 2010. Do you feel they deserve your votes anymore? Please let me know in all the usual ways. GB Views at GBNews.com. But first, here's your news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Martin, thank you very much and good afternoon. First, to some breaking news. The first group of Israeli hostages have been released by the Hamas terror group and are now in Egypt. These pictures show the hostages being transferred to Egypt in Red Cross cars via the Rafa crossing a short time ago. The Red Cross says it's carrying out a multi-day operation to facilitate the transfer. We can take you live now to the Offa prison in Israel. In return for the release of those hostages, Israel will release 39 Palestinians from its prisons. A further 12 Thai hostages were released by the terror group a short while ago, following mediation efforts by Egypt. That news was confirmed by the Prime Minister of Thailand and is understood more may be released in the coming days. A temporary pause in the fighting between Israel and Hamas came into force this morning, which is expected to last for four days. We will, of course, bring you more on this developing story as we get it. Now to other news, 34 people have been arrested after riots and violent scenes in Dublin yesterday. A clean-up was underway this morning in the city centre after cars were set alight and shops were looted. A number of police officers were also injured. The violence was sparked after three children and a woman were stabbed close to a school in the city yesterday. A five-year-old girl is said to be in a serious condition. Taoiseach Leo Varadkar said the people involved in the unrest brought shame on the country. Those involved brought shame on Dublin, brought shame on Ireland and brought shame on their families and themselves. These criminals did not do what they did because they love Ireland. They did not do what they did because they wanted to protect Irish people. They did not do it out of any sense of patriotism, however warped. They did so because they are filled with hate. They love violence, they love chaos and they love causing pain to others. Oscar Pistorius will be freed from prison on parole in January, nearly 11 years after killing his girlfriend Reva Steenkamp on Valentine's Day in 2013. The former Paralympic champion, who's now 37 years old, claimed that he fired the gun through a bathroom door after mistaking his partner for an intruder, saying he feared for his safety. He was initially jailed for five years, but an appeal saw him sent back for six years in 2016, less than half of the 15-year minimum term that had been sought by prosecutors. Nissan has announced a £1.2 billion plan to build electric versions of two new cars at its Sunderland plant. The Japanese automaker's new electric Qashqai and Duke models will be manufactured at the site. It's also expected to bring wider investment in the industry, including the construction of a new gigafactory, to make more batteries. 
Rishi Sunak's facing a backlash from senior members of his own party after new figures revealed migration is at an all-time high. Reports suggest MPs are demanding action to reduce the number of people coming legally to the UK. Net migration peaked at 745,000 last year, a record high. Work and Pensions Secretary Mel Stride says measures to reduce the number are already in place. We accept that the figures are too high and that's why, for example, recently we announced that in the case of 150,000 student visas, we'd be clamping down on them, uh, bringing uh, dependents in uh, with them. We're putting up the cost of uh, visas, uh, a number of different measures. And the OBR, who are the independent forecasters, uh, who look at the kind of impacts of these steps, recognise that this will uh, in itself start to bring uh, the level of migration down, but there is more to be done. And a familiar face is returning to London's Oxford Street as music shop HMV reopens its doors. The historic retailer returns today after a four-year absence, reclaiming its old flagship location in what's hoped to be a boost for the popular shopping strip. GB News reporter Ray Addison is there. His return to profit means that new owner Doug Putnam has been able to reopen the brand's flagship store four years after it shut down here on Oxford Street. He's going to be hoping that it can once again become a mainstay of the high street. Now, over the years, influential acts such as Michael Jackson, the Spice Girls and the Beatles, no less, have all performed here. It's also been used as an air raid shelter in World War II and burnt to the ground and been rebuilt. Now, it'll have to survive the tough economic conditions as many shoppers tighten their belts. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now back to Martin. And thank you, Tatiana. Now we start with the dramatic news coming out of the Middle East. And the International Red Cross has confirmed that its teams have started carrying out a multi-day prep operation to facilitate the release and transfer of hostages held in Gaza and of Palestinian detainees. Hamas released several hostages after a four-day ceasefire with Israel came into force. Twelve are Thai nationals. Israeli media has reported that 13 Israeli hostages have been transferred to Egypt. Well, I'm joined now in the studio by our home and security editor, Mark White, with all of the latest. Mark, so dramatic stuff. And we've got, there's an update since you last came in. I think we've got some pictures here. And we can show live pictures from the prison. And also, you say there are images from the Rafa crossing of Red Cross vehicles, I believe. Yeah, you're seeing these uh, pictures now if you're watching on GB News television. That shots of a four vehicle convoy of uh, white Red Cross four wheel drive vehicles uh, carrying those hostages that have just been released. Some rare good news in this. Uh, bloody conflict across the Gaza Strip with 12 Thai nationals, we understand, and 13 Israeli hostages that have been released. And I've seen some other pictures on I-24, an Israeli channel, where you can quite clearly see in the lead two vehicles uh, Thai nationals. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly look to me like they're Thai citizens. And then in the vehicles behind, uh, some women, elderly women with their grey hair and some children oh. uh, in there as well. So fantastic news. Uh, of course, this will be very, very much welcomed across Israel and not just Israel, but right around the world, as you hear from these Thai nationals and other nationalities that are caught up in this unfolding hostage situation with seven weeks. Uh, these people have been held in deep tunnel systems underneath the Gaza Strip. It's a very precarious operation. This is day one. We're expecting, if all goes well, many more days of this as the hostages will come out 13, 14, 15 at a time, whatever it might be on any given day. Uh, we're expecting this could last some three weeks uh, if all goes according to plan, this truce will last for that period of time as well. And in addition, of course, to the very welcome departure of the hostages after the ordeal that they have suffered, there is also then the aid convoys mm. going in to the beleaguered citizens of the Gaza Strip. 
200 trucks a day, we're told, are going in. Uh, already today, around about 100 trucks have gone in, and they include fuel trucks for the first time to help with the humanitarian agencies in Gaza and the hospitals across the Gaza Strip as well. 130,000 litres of fuel each day that this truce lasts. So it's advantageous, of course, to both Israel and to the people of Gaza that this truce lasts for as long as possible. And who knows, if we get a truce over a long period of time, it might pave the way for something more meaningful in terms of a ceasefire. The only caveat I would add to that is that in Hamas's own words from their senior spokesman, who've been interviewed quite a bit in recent weeks, they continue to talk about wanting to launch more in the way of 7th of October-style terrorist attacks on Israel. They've never wanted to negotiate any kind of peace with Israel, they are uh, their goal at the end of the day, uh, their stated goal is to destroy Israel, to drive the Israeli population into the sea um, and to free Palestine in that way. So, you know, a lot of that we know is, is rhetoric, but we've seen how that's, it's not just rhetoric and it's actually uh, manifested in a very bloody way on the 7th of October and in the weeks since with all these rockets that continue to come over into Gaza. And we're also uh, just showing Israel. pictures there of the, of the prison, the offer prison in, in Israel, Mark, where Palestinian prisoners are expected to be released in exchange for those Israeli hostages. We believe 39 prisoners are being swapped over. And presumably, Mark, those Palestinian prisoners are people of significant note, of interest, perhaps with terrorist links to Hamas. And so that's a significant admission um, to allow those men, you'd assume, to, to be set free. And that may in itself pose a future um, security risk, but nevertheless, that's part of the deal. Some of them certainly do pose a security risk. They're convicted uh, or are awaiting trial on some very serious terror charges. Mm -hmm. There are others, though, amongst them who are really quite young in age and who were arrested for uh, rioting, throwing stones, at the Israeli military right. and that kind of thing. But no doubt in amongst them are some fairly unsavoury characters as well. But from Israel's point of view, you know, they're holding their nose, Martin. Mm -hmm. They are doing what they have to do to achieve the release of their, cit you know, their citizens. And we know uh, those uh, Israeli nationals are elderly women, young children, younger women, uh, men. There are some is Israeli military uh, in there as well. Uh, they may be the last to be released. Uh, it is a very difficult, precarious situation going forward. It will uh, take a lot of delicate ne negotiations mm. to continue to ensure that all of those, at least 240 hostages, are released safely by the end of this. Yeah, we can now show um, viewers on GB News live pictures from Egyptian TV from Rafa. Uh, Here we are, Mark. And that looks like is this, this is hostages coming out, um, emergency vehicles, ambulances. Uh, yeah, so it's the Red Cross vehicles initially, uh, four white four-wheel drive mm -hmm. vehicles with the Red Cross flags in convoy that have come out. They've now gone to a medical centre in Egypt on the Sinai Peninsula where they are being checked at this centre. And then you have a fleet of ambulances there waiting to take them to a nearby military base where they will be flown out by helicopter wow. to Israel for further assessment, uh, both medically, psychologically, and, of course, they will have to be debriefed as much as they can by Israeli intelligence to try to get as much information as they can on the conditions they were held in, where they were held, um, the, the, you know, how they were treated uh, by Hamas when they were underground. But a, re a very welcome yeah. sight, of course, very encouraging to see that they have now crossed over into the safety of Egypt and now it's just a matter of getting them processed, getting them assessed, 
we don't know what the kind, you know, what kind of medical condition or indeed psychological condition they will be in after having been held since the 7th of October. And Mark, after weeks and weeks of unimaginable horror, the reflection on what happened on October the 7th and what these individuals have been through, as you say, a hugely positive moment of hope. But who knows what they've been through? And I guess that's the next stage. The medical facilities, the psychologists, they will assess them, they will try and unpack their experience. The intelligence services will try and ascertain what they, what they saw, what they know. And then, of course, there'll be enormous global media interest in their stories. Yes, uh, and we saw, of course, on the 23rd of October when Jochavid Lifshitz and uh, Nurit Cooper were released to elderly Israeli women, uh, that Yochavid was so determined that mm. really within hours mm. of being released and being medically assessed, she wanted to hold a news conference mm. to speak about, well, how she was treated, how she was feeling, her gratitude uh, for those that had helped achieve her release, but also to express her deep concern, mm. the fact that her husband is still being held by Hamas. And we don't believe that her husband was among those released today because the information that we're getting is it's women and children mm. that have been released, elderly women and young children that were being held by Hamas that have how, been released. How important do you think this is in, in shifting the, the dial in terms of the, the war of words? Because until now, there was a huge rhetoric from... from Benjamin Netanyahu about they will not stop until Hamas is eradicated, wiped off the surface of the earth. And now this is a very different emotional cadence, isn't it? This is, it's like, yeah, maybe if we, if we go for a ceasefire, we can see some hope, a change of pace. And as I understand it, Mark, for each 10 hostages released, there'll be an additional day of ceasefire. So could this drag, could this go on for days and days and days? Yeah, I mean, that's the hope uh, for these initial releases, it's going to be a four-day yeah. truce. But if Hamas then continue on the path that was set up by these Qatari negotiators, uh, that would mean 10 hostages in the additional days that followed. Now, if you're talking still about 200-odd being held even after 50 have been released, mm. then we're, we're talking the better part of a month yeah. where you could have a cessation of violence if that truce holds. And that can bring about a whole new mindset in terms of, look, you know, from Hamas's point of view as well, they've been very badly battered, we know that, by Israel. And whatever their very uh, bellicose rhetoric about destroying Israel and launching more terrorist attacks, at the end of the day, they may want to sue for peace as in fact, well. In fact, Mark, I have a breaking news line here. The Qatar Foreign Ministry has confirmed the release of 39 women and children detained in Israeli jails. Just to repeat that, the Qatar Foreign Ministry has confirmed the release of 39 women and children detained in Israeli jails. So, Mark, that's even more optimistic than we were hoping earlier on today. Uh, well, no, this is the Palestinians that are being held on the West Bank. So this is offer prison in the West Bank. It was part of this deal. Qatar were brokering that deal, of course, yeah, weren't they? Yeah, to, to release the, uh, the Palestinians in response. So the fact now that these nope. hostages have been released and are safe in Egyptian soil means that the 39 Palestinians who are being held in the West Bank have been released. So that's what we were expecting, confirmation that that has now happened. And they are a mix of women, uh, some mm -hmm. of these women convicted of some quite serious terrorist offences, and children, teenagers, mm -hmm. who've been involved, some of them just involved uh, in... I say just, but involved in rioting and throwing stones uh, and the like. So not high-end terrorists by any means, but still clearly, from Israel's point, uh, a potential security risk. But the deal that's been brokered is for them to be released. And indeed, over the coming four days, uh, at the end of it, it'll be about 150 of these Palestinian prisoners, women and children mostly, mm. that will be released as part of this deal in 
um, the exchange for the 50 hostages mm -hmm. that we expect over the coming days. And then if we go forward to the other 200 still being held hostage, yeah. then three times that number will be released from Palestinian, from the Israeli prisons. Was it always the, the case, Mark, that the Palestinian prisoners were known as women and children. Was, was that public knowledge? Or I, mean, I, I just assumed that they'd be the kind of no male terrorists. But this is, is no, this... they're women and children. But you know, they're, they're women capable and indeed yes. that have carried out terrorist attacks yeah. and failed terrorist attacks. So you know, um, there, there will be women and children amongst that lot, who of course many on the Palestinian side will say are not a threat and they were, you know, held uh, wrongly yeah. by the Israelis. But from the Israeli perspective, there are people being held there who have been either convicted or are about to stand trial for some v quite serious mm. terrorist offences, att attempting to attack the Israeli military with bombs and petrol bombs and that, mm -hmm. uh, that type of thing. So... Mm. Um, but, look, this is where we are. We've seen this before in terms of Israeli hostages who've been released, and then you will get a larger number, actually, of Palestinians, and sometimes these are Palestinian men um, who are being held mm. on quite serious terror charges. At the moment, it's women and children. And it looks like, the so far, then, both sides have honoured their pledges. So the exchange thus far appears to be smooth. The 39 Palestinians have been released, and we can see those Red Cross vehicles there at the Rafah crossing the, on the Egyptian side. Um, in fact, there, look, we, we can see people... Look, there's an elderly woman, look, Mark, being walked out, it appears, by Red Cross medical staff. It appears that's a hostage walking out, being released on live TV in Egypt. Well, there's certainly someone in the middle as well with a face mask on. Yeah. But, so, yeah, I mean, it's two people together. I think that's an elderly woman... Being, being helped and assisted mm. by uh, perhaps a member of the Red Cross. Now, they will go into this centre, as I say, uh, to be assessed. We got some pictures released by the Israeli military actually earlier today that showed us inside the centre and what they have. They've set up kind of what they call soft areas mm. uh, to help people uh, sit down and talk to the officials. Remember, there'll be officials there from Israeli intelligence yeah. as well who in quick time want to try to glean as much information as they can about where they've been held, the conditions they've been held, what they were able to tell them about their captors, uh, the other people that were being held uh, in those tunnels with them. Um, but because there are children there, there's lots of soft toys mm. around them. The Israeli mediators who are effectively reaching out to uh, these released hostages, and they are the conduit back in to normal society for them again. They've been told just to constantly make eye contact with them, not to go and hug and cuddle the children, though, and if, unless it's very you know, clear that the child wants that kind of tactile response because you just don't know yeah. uh, what these poor children have been through over these many weeks down there and they might be too traumatised to actually want any adult to have physical contact with them at this stage. So it's a very delicate process that we're embarking on now where these Red Cross vehicles have arrived, the ambulances are waiting to take them eventually to the helicopters. Mm -hmm. I should say in the helicopters as well, they've all got special uh, noise-cancelling headphones yeah. just to lessen the trauma of the helicopter journey uh, to central Israel, to Tel Aviv. It's a um, children's hospital that the children will be taken to in eastern uh, Tel Aviv as the officials wait outside for that journey to begin. It may be some time uh, within the centre before they're initially given that first response, uh, that first kind of assessment uh, before they're able to, to move them. It, I, it will depend on how these people are reacting, responding and feeling themselves and what they find in terms of their condition about how quickly they can move them. And the reports um, here of cheers erupting as the Red Cross cars crossed into Egypt from Gaza, um, the recipients welcoming them on the Egyptian side. And as we can see there, Mark, being transferred into very high-tech 
ambulances, a great many medical staff waiting in attendance to give them the care they need and deserve. Yes, and they uh, will be taken, as I say, initially to a military base where the Egyptian helicopters are waiting. And, of course, there are more people than we had initially mm. anticipated because we had been told that 13 would be the number being released today. Then suddenly we were hit with the news that also 12 Thai nationals yeah. have been released in a separate deal. The Israeli release was brokered by the Qataris. The Thai nationals' release has been brokered by the Egyptians. Um, so they will have to be uh, dealt with as well. We're also told that the Thai nationals will be taken into Israel as well, uh, of course, to be assessed medically. But the uh, military intelligence and the Shin Bet will want to speak to those Thai nationals. Yeah. They're adults as well, so it's easier to speak to them than potentially, um, you know, young children and, and maybe very elderly and frail people as well. So to speak to those 12 Thai nationals to gain as much information from as many of them as possible about where they may have been held in different areas, in different tunnel mm. systems, what can they tell them about the captors, how they were treated, were there groups of them all together, how long did they have to go through the tunnel systems. We know that uh, Jochaved Lifshitz, uh, when she gave her news conference, said that she was walked for hours mm. through these tunnel systems that were wet, she described it, on the floor um, of the tunnel systems themselves. And that's no surprise because there are hundreds of miles of tunnels that are under the Gaza Strip. And although the Israeli authorities and the Israeli military have uncovered quite a few of those tunnel systems, including, by the way, under the Al-Shifa hospital, the main yes. hospital in the Gaza Strip, where there has been so much outrage and indignation that the Israelis should be anywhere near that hospital, that it was a purely a medical facility caring for the injured of mm -hmm. Gaza. Well, the Israelis and indeed the Americans said that there was a command and control centre under that hospital and within the last few days, they are surely, uh, slowly but surely, uh, in, uh, you know, unearthed more and more of what they say mm. is very much like a command and control centre underneath that hospital. And Mark, one of the most emotional aspects of all this, of course, was the... In fact, we can see live images there, Mark. It appears to be another elderly lady being walked away from an ambulance by yeah. a, a health worker. Um, yeah, she, she looks steady on her feet. He's helping her. Dramatic. So this is a, a hostage being walked away by the looks of it, Mark. That's, that must be, must be the case. Yeah, no, no, it's a, a, a very encouraging uh, image. And, of course, for those family Astonished. members as well that will be watching that. Now, the, that woman and the woman before um, look very much like uh, the, uh, the, the women that I saw in the Red Cross vehicles yeah. that were coming. It was two of them sat together, a uh, very distinctive... Uh, with the grey hair, gray, short grey hair. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, they're being led into this medical facility um, slowly, but on, on, on their feet, clearly determined uh, to walk in with the, uh, the aid of uh, an official there bringing them in. But you can just imagine that across Israel and across the world with people who have uh, an interest in this, many nationalities, including British, Irish, French, US citizens, yeah. and as we know, Thai citizens in there will absolutely be rejoicing at these images. Incredibly emotional seeing. to watch. I mean, that could be anyone's gran, anyone's mum being, being helped out of an ambulance there by health staff. Often the relatives must have given up hope so many times. And we talk about children being released, Mark, and one of the most emotional aspects was taking children in cold blood out of Israel on October the 7th. And heaven knows what they've been through in the subsequent time. We've seen, some, we've seen so many emotional press conferences with parents who'd given up hope of their children being alive. And these images are, are incredible. This is hostages being released in real time. And in many ways, Mark, this changes the entire emotional landscape of this conflict. Now it's, it's taken on a, a very emotional, heart-wrenching, very public aspect. Yeah, we should say um, 
there, there's kind of conflicting news in terms of those being uh, released in terms of the Thai nationalities. Right. Um, there was a report, and this actually came from the Thai Prime Minister, that uh, 12 Thai nationals had been released. However, other reports now suggesting it may be 10 Thais and one Filipino. Right. Now, this would make sense because the International Red Cross had said um, about 45 minutes ago. OK, so I've got a breaking news line here, Mark. Uh, Ekatar, foreign ministry spokesperson, has said those released include 13 Israeli citizens, some of whom are dual citizens, in addition to 10 Thai citizens and a Filipino citizen. So just to repeat that, a Qatar foreign ministry spokesperson has said those released include 13 Israeli citizens, some of whom are dual citizens, in addition to 10 Thai citizens and a Filipino citizen. So echoing what you just said there, Mark. Yeah, no, this is exactly yeah. what I was telling you. Yeah. Uh, 10 Thais, one Filipino, which then makes sense because 45 minutes ago, the International Red Cross had said that 24 is the number of hostages that have been released. And that had not made sense to a lot of people because with 12 Thais and 13 Israelis, yep. that's 25. Yep. So the fact that that number of Thais has been revised down to 10 Thai nationals and one Filipino national makes a lot of sense. And here we've got another... Yeah. It looks like an elderly uh, a female lady. that's yeah. that's been taken out there, being helped by two... Um, people, one on either side of her, uh, being taken out towards the medical centre as well. I mean, you know, it, it's heartening, but it's also heartbreaking to see yeah. such elderly, vulnerable people who must have been through such horrors mm. uh, in uh, recent weeks, uh, abducted in the most violent way by yeah. these Hamas terrorists. And when we saw... People were shot dead, That's right. massacred in front of them. And when we saw those images on October the 7th, when the Hamas were broadcasting those images themselves, the video footage on social media of pensioners, of women, of children being abducted, Mark, it, it was it were images that horrified the world. And now here we are seeing some of them, at least, being walked out of ambulances to safety in Egypt. Yeah, no, it, it, it is just... We've had relentlessly, and, you know, I sp spent a few weeks in, in Israel just day after day of the most horrific of news that has come through about uh, the, the strikes on Gaza, the, the death toll uh, on the Israeli uh, citizens who were caught up in this on the 7th of October, the toll on the Israeli forces going into Gaza as well. So to get a day like today mm -hmm. with actually good news to report in this conflict is, is tremendous. And we can only hope mm -hmm. that this day paves the way for the continuation of the hostage release process with the remainder of the 50 mm -hmm. initial hostages going to be released. And then hopefully that's snowballing on to the 200 or so still being held as well. And Mark, having spent that time in Tel Aviv, in Israel, you were on the border of Gaza. You've been around a lot of Israeli people. How will this news be received by them? Because you've spent time with them, you've got into the emotional side of this, and those kidnap posters, those missing person posters, they took on a huge part of this war of information. These kinds of images, the hope, the, the joy of this, how would that be received in Israel by the people you met? It will be celebrated without a doubt. You know, there's mm. been a lot of anguish and heartache and criticism of the government mm. and the intelligence services on the intelligence that was missed in the run-up to October the 7th. Mm. There were questions for the Israeli government that will still have to be answered in the uh, weeks and months ahead. Uh, but for the Israeli population, They've been deeply, deeply traumatised by the horrific attacks on the 7th of October, which left more than 1,200 mm. uh, of their fellow citizens murdered, hundreds more of them injured, 
uh, in the most appalling of uh, manners. And then, of course, realising that as a, a nation they are at war, many of the population have been called up uh, because they're reservists to go into Gaza to try to deal with Hamas. So days like today will be very, very welcome. We've seen, you know, day after day in central Tel Aviv, hundreds, thousands of people mm -hmm. turn up into the main square where there is makeshift shrines around there uh, to those who have died, to those who have been taken hostage. She said the posters mm -hmm. that are all around Tel Aviv as well. Um, they were, you know, th there's no doubt uh, the people of Israel will be celebrating, but it will also be tempered by the knowledge that this is only a tiny proportion yeah. of those who Hamas are holding. Politically, will things change now? There have been a lot of calls for ceasefires, of course, United Nations, the international community, at home, the Labour Party, the SNP. If we can see so very clearly the, the impacts, the fruits, if you like, of at least a temporary ceasefire with dramatic imagery like this of elderly, the, the, the frail, the infirm, and later on, no doubt, children being released, if a ceasefire looks like this, will the pressure mount for more of this? Well, look, you've got the very public political rhetoric of uh, Israel's leaders who are determined to show their resolve that they are going to go after Hamas and they are going to ensure that Hamas no longer poses a threat to Israeli uh, citizens across the country. And, you know, they still do. Uh, as early or as late as this morning, they were still firing rockets into communities around the Gaza Strip. Tel Aviv has come under uh, its biggest bombardment since seven, the 7th of October, just in the last week. Mm. There's still a very significant capability that Hamas has and a determination that Hamas has to still go after Israel's civilian population. So while that is the case, uh, we're seeing it looks like some very young people actually yeah. being led from that building uh, into towards the coaches, um, so, yeah, uh, yeah some very young children there. There are women and children, and there's another elderly lady being taken. That child looks about seven, eight, nine years old. Could be my daughter. Wow. Amazing. Another elderly lady there being brought out. They seem to be walking well, though. They seem to be steady on their feet. You know, they don't seem... They're not physically injured, at least, we can, these ones we can see here. Well, it will be very interesting to hear from them about yes. the conditions that they were held in and you know, how, how they were treated and, and fed and, and looked after if they were. Uh, but it's very encouraging, as you say, mm. that they are on their feet there. Now, it's also interesting that they're getting into uh, a bus here. Now, it may well be that those that are a bit more frail, uh, that have suffered a bit more, will go on to a bus. Hey, it's that. also, listen, it's also possible that these are family members. Yes. Um, I'm just not... 100% sure, so I don't want to mislead our audience, but it, it looks as though they may have been the hostages or some of the hostages going on to the bus there rather than into the ambulance. There seem to be um, what would appear to be... They, they would fit the, the remit of a bunch of Thai people there moving single file towards that coach. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but... Um, although there was a few there, that was probably maybe about... 15. Yeah. Um, and we know, of course, that 24 people have been released, so it's possible uh, some of the, the more frail, uh, those in perhaps a worse condition, will be placed into the ambulances. Uh, maybe the ambulances are just there on, you know, on standby as a contingency uh, in case people did require that kind of medical transport and not just in the back of a bus. Mm. Um, and some more people just more. coming out there. Another as well. woman. Again, she's moving unaided. Yeah, and I think the fact that some of them clearly have blankets wrapped around them would tend to me to indicate that yes. they're, they're hostage rather than, you know, family members. Mm -hmm. I, also, let, let's put it this way I don't think family members would necessarily be there at that stage. They wouldn't know. This is the handover yeah. into 
the, the centre where it's the medical staff assessing mm -hmm. them, the intelligence services trying to just have an, some initial conversations with those that have been released. Um, so not necessarily the families. That's probably uh, any family members are going to be waiting on the Israeli side when they get there. Um, you were saying before about where we, we go from here. And I was saying, look, we've, we've got the situation where Israel has still been coming under daily attack from these Hamas rockets. They have the capability, they have the determination, it seems, to continue uh, to target Israel's population, civilian population centres. So while that's the case and Israel perceives Hamas as a threat, then despite the imperative at the moment to get the hostages released, at the end of that process, I think it's likely that there will be a re resumption in, in some form of the military action unless we get some kind of commitment and guarantees it can be brokered by the likes of Qatar mm. that that's it as far as Hamas is concerned. But Hamas would have to refrain from all of the bellicose rhetoric that we've seen mm. from its leaders in recent weeks where, and we know a lot of it is playing to their audience, but they would have to give that commitment that this is at an end, that they are yeah. not going to target Israel anymore for Israel to uh, in any way consider uh, a cessation, a permanent cessation of their military operation. Yeah, and if you're just joining us now, it's worth a quick recap. Hostages have been released um, from Gaza into Egypt through the Rafa crossing. 13 Israeli citizens, 10 Thai citizens and a Filipino citizen released. We've seen live images. What very much appears to be those hostages, they now are on a bus leaving this medical compound. Mark, and you said they are now going towards an air base and they'll be taken back to Israel. Is that correct? That's right. They'll be flown by a helicopter to Israel. Uh, it's clear they've had some kind of initial assessment at this facility they were taken to uh, in Egypt. And thanks to uh, our colleagues in Egyptian television for these remarkable images. Amazing. Aerial high shots, low shots, uh, incredible footage of the very heartening scene of the release of these hostages. And it looked to me, Martin, that those going on board the bus was uh, as near as, damn it, the, the 24 yeah, it um, that we would, you know, have considered for the release here. And, and amongst them were some very elderly people, some very young children as well, clearly, and uh, people that looked either to be Thai or Filipino as yes. well that were going uh, in there. So there are some ambulances moving now as well behind that bus, but it seems the vast majority uh, of the, the people seem to be aboard that bus, which in itself is very encouraging, Martin. It means that, you know, they are in good enough physical condition that they don't require that kind of emergency transport in ambulances. That's right. They were walking um, entirely unaided. They were on their feet. A couple of the elderly ladies, as you'd imagine, were being... Um, they had an arm to lean on, but they, they looked in good health from what we could see. Yeah, which, given that they have been held in captivity since the 7th of October, is remarkable. Yes. But we don't know uh, the way that they have been treated by Hamas, the food uh, that they have been given or denied, the medical, uh, especially for some of the elderly mm. people there, may have had medication, required a medication. We know from uh, Jochevin Lifshitz, who I was talking about, uh, the hostage that was, was released on the 23rd of October, she said, Martin, that um, she was actually given regular sort of medical assessments. A doctor was brought down into the tunnel system to see her every two or three days. Uh, she was given her medication as well. So, you know, they have a fairly sophisticated setup, mm. uh, Hamas. Um, but you've also got to ask yourself, you know, with doctors going down into this tunnel system, you know, where are these doctors coming from? What medical facilities? Uh, what did they know? about the, the, the sort of uh, where these hostages were being held. And, 
you know, I'm not saying they were complicit in it. They were probably blindfolded and taken down there yeah. anyway. But uh, at least it's encouraging. It seems that medical attention was was uh, offered to one of the hostages, uh, Jochaved, as I say, uh, who said that. So we can hope that that has been the case for quite a lot and of the hostages. Presumably, Mark, um, nobody would know who was on that, on those buses coming out. So maybe the relatives were finding out. You can imagine the entire nation scanning the faces of the people coming out of those buses. Is that somebody I know? Is that a relative of mine? We just saw in real time really high-quality close-up footage of a real-time hostage release. Yeah, I mean, what, what we can say is that actually the families will know. Um, the families of those being released were informed by the Israeli government that their loved ones were being released today. Wow. Um, others who were not informed obviously then were... Uh, having to deal with the realisation that their loved ones are still in captivity, yeah. hopefully will be released in the coming days, but no guarantee of that at all. So the, the families won't have got a shock by seeing the images on live television. They will have known. Yeah. They will have been very encouraged mm. to see their loved ones walking off. Well, astonishing images. Thank you, Mark White, for that comprehensive um, commentary on what is an astonishing moment. Um, the hostages being released, 13 Israelis, 10 ties, one Filipino. Fantastic imagery from Egyptian TV there in real time and after many, many weeks of desperate messaging, um, a moment of real hope. Thank you, Mark White. And, of course, we'll bring you more on that story throughout the show as, no doubt, it emerges. Now, moving on to another story, to the fallout from last night's riots in Dublin. And the Republic of Ireland's Premier says the hundreds of people involved in violent scenes brought shame onto their country. 34 people were arrested in riots that saw buses and trams burned, shops looted and several police vehicles damaged. The Sinn Féin leader, Mary Lou Macdonald, has called on the Irish Justice Minister and Garda Commissioner to resign, saying there had been an unacceptable failure to keep people safe yesterday evening. The violence was triggered by a knife attack on three school children and their care assistant outside a school in the city centre yesterday lunchtime. Well, let's cross now to Dublin and speak to our reporter, Doogie Beatty. Doogie, um, yesterday's tragic um, incident outside the school um, became then the, the, the powder keg moment to a riot which kind of went on for hours in Dublin. Huge damage done. What's the fallout been overnight? Well, I'm standing actually just off O'Connell Street and you can see behind me here, this is one of the hotels and it's got no windows in the bottom of it. <clears throat> They're all boarded up. Uh, last night it was attacked quite badly. But uh, this has been boiling under, just under the surface, probably for about the last 24 months. Uh, the North Dublin is where you will find the real Dublin folk, if you like. It is a area of Dublin that would have had uh, many manual workers in it over the years and they of course have their own communities now over these this last few years those communities have had many migrants put into place there including migrant centers etc and there has been quite a lot of opposition to it now we've just heard in the last while or two that there is another protest uh, scheduled for tonight in the GPO just across the road from me here and one of my colleagues that was traveling back north has informed me that the PSNI's water cannon are on their way in just outside Dublin. So we can only imagine that Drew Harris, the ex, the, the current uh, Chief Constable of the Garda Shia Khanna, who was also the ex Deputy Chief Constable of um, uh, the uh, PSNI, has used his contacts to uh, acquire those water cannon. And there is quite a lot of Garda riot squad in and around this area at this minute in time. There's also a lot of youth starting to gather in and around this area. So tonight could be uh, a night where either the guards are going to uh, clamp down extremely hard. I would imagine that they're not going to let the same amount of people gather in this uh, city. Uh, but it is looking slightly ominous at this point that things might start to kick off again tonight. I would imagine it will be smaller skirmishes because of the amount of presence of police that are currently here. But it is, it is a, 
really a, a picture of what is happening, not just in Ireland, but the whole way across the UK and indeed Europe. Many of the people that were born and reared here really do feel that they are being left behind. And the political comments today coming from uh, the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar, you can understand where he's coming from. You can see that he doesn't want uh, the, the jewel in the crown of, of Ireland, Dublin City. He doesn't want it uh, destroyed. And the financial process that will have to come in to bring this back together will we'll only tell on the taxpayers of Ireland. So at this minute in time, politics in Ireland is uh, really in somewhat of a flux in, in this last 24 hour period. As you've said, Mary Lou Macdonald waiting in. Of course, she's the leader of Sinn Féin. And they, she is due, if you look at the polls, to be the next Taoiseach of Ireland. So really, uh, what will happen in the next 24 hours here in Dublin may well uh, change politics for a little while. And Doogie, um, how um, instructive do you think the comments of Leo Varadkar have been today, um, slamming the protesters last night, calling them cowardly chaplains? Your anger, your hate, and how you blame others for your problems was the target of his ire. Will that help, do you think, to calm things down, or will it help to inflame ahead of tonight's protest? Well, I think Leo Varadkar's comments will, will probably... He is a politician, and at the end of the day, he is the, the Prime Minister of this country. He is trying to do his best for it. But, like, as I've said, the whole way I've crossed Europe at this minute in time, this problem is it's coming to the fore again and again. And, they, you know, they will have to do something. How his comments play out this evening, I'm not too sure. Uh, He's entitled to his opinion, as are the protesters here. And if they protest peacefully, well, then there should be no problem. But uh, they really have to look now at the problems that these communities are looking at and why they are unhappy. Uh, they are living in a very vibrant modern European city. You, you would have to wonder what the problems are, and you'll only find that out by talking to them. And of course, we have been down here. We've been talking to both sides that are that are in amongst this particular uh, particular um, process. But someone will have to listen at some time and take on board what's being said. OK, Doogie Beatty, thanks for that update from Dublin. Another night to protest ahead and the water cannon are now being sent in. We'll make sure we keep it on that story th throughout the evening for you on GB News. Now, more now from the controversial book written by Harry and Meghan's biographer. Omid Scobie claims that King Charles was in tears because he was worried about Prince Andrew's mental health following the Jeffrey Epstein scandal. Scobie also says it was Prince William, more than any of the other senior royals, who wanted Andrew to be marginalised. The author claims William is colder than his father. Well, I'm joined now by the former BBC Royal correspondent, the resplendent Jenny Bond. Jenny, it's always a fantastic pleasure to see you. So this book, Endgame by Scobie, is causing endless problems to the royals, isn't it? Uh, yes, it's already been described as a bombshell with all sorts of explosive allegations. Um, I really don't think it is. haven't actually read anything that surprised me at all so far. Uh, you talk about Charles being allegedly in tears over Andrew's mental health. Well, um, Charles is a softy. He, he's always been a very sentimental sort of guy, and Andrew is his little brother. And I, I don't think that uh, Charles is without feelings, but... Uh, how much he uh, really broke down in tears, I think, is unlikely to, to be true. I think probably that's exaggerated. I mean, you know, Charles had his 75th birthday party um, last week at Clarence House, and although we don't have confirmation of exactly who was there, there is no indication whatsoever that Andrew was invited uh, amongst this small group of relatives who were there. So I'm not quite sure how close they are. So basically, haven't seen much in this book that surprises me. And the thing about this um, book, Jenny, of course, Scobie is the Sussex's lead cheerleader anyhow. So how much of this do you think is true and how much of it do you think needs a substantial pinch of sodium chloride? <laughs> well, Omid is very, very hot on the fact that he, this is not... He says, I'm not Meg's pal. Uh, this isn't to do with Harry and Meghan. Their story is only a small part of this book, which is curiously called Endgame. I mean, I don't know if in it, because we haven't seen the full book yet, is he predicting the end of the monarchy? I'm not quite sure. 
I mean, we learned that, that Meghan uh, was unhappy in the UK and has no intention of setting foot in the UK again, apparently. Uh, that's not really a surprise. That she didn't come to the coronation, not only because uh, it was Archie's fourth birthday, but uh, because she didn't want to step back into what she regards as the soap opera um, of the royal family. Well, I think Harry and Meghan have got their own soap opera going on, actually, to be truthful. Um, so... I don't see the bombshells in this, but it's routinely being described as such for publicity purposes, I'm sure. And, Jenny, the revelation that William is colder than his father won't help. I mean, he's always been very open about his feelings. He's done a lot of work with mental health charity, for example. Yeah, the William I have known um, is not cold, but he's tough and he's stubborn, and I think he's had to be tough um, and very focused now, being alone, without his brother to support him, without his wingman. Um, and I think probably he is the tough one of that generation of royals. But that's how, that's how he's got to be, and I don't think it's any bad thing. And do you think there'll be anything left in this book? I mean, it seems most of it's been leaked to the press before it's even out. <laughs> it was ever thus, wasn't it? Um, look, I, I don't want to dis Omid. He's a, he's a journalist, he's a royal reporter, uh, and maybe he does have great contacts, but he's quoted as writing that a close friend of Catherine, of Kate, um, had uh, had told him uh, that Catherine had been, hadn't got on with Meghan. I mean, look, a close friend of Catherine was never, ever going to speak to Omid Scobie. OK, Johnny Bond, thank you for joining us on GB News. It's always a pleasure to see you and to hear from you. Thank you. Now, a reminder of this hour's huge breaking news from the Middle East. Hamas has released 24 hostages and 39 Palestinian women and children who were held in Israeli jails have also been released. We have dramatic um, footage of elderly people being taken into care. Rare positive images in what's been a bleak time. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News and this is Britain's News Channel. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you? <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's your new teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News.
Big stories, big guests, and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome to GB News, it's five o'clock. I'm Martin Dormney. Loads coming up in this next hour, including our top story, dramatic images of 24 hostages released into Egypt by Hamas, and that includes 10 Thais, 13 Israelis, and one Filipino. We have live images of them coming out of health vehicles, an incredibly moving moment in a bleak past few weeks. Amazing stuff coming on that. Next up. More riots predicted in Dublin tonight, and the Garda is deploying water cannon ahead of that. We just heard that in the last few minutes, and we're looking what really caused those riots last night. Feels like Dublin has been a powder keg for many, many months. We'll have the full inside story on that. Next up. A surprise poll bump for the Conservatives. It seems the autumn statement landed well, and in particular, the national minimum wage and the benefits boost, things you might actually think are more Labour policies, have landed very well. Could the Tories be saved by the autumn statement? And of course, a show wouldn't be a show without a bit of Nigel Farage. And once again, he got his down under out, down under. This time, he went for a full bath. He freaked out his jungle mates, but he's doing very well. We'll have the full inside story on the rumble in the jungle. Coming up, that's all coming up in the next hour. So just amazing images of elderly ladies and a child and just all these hostages being released at the raft, at the crossing. Just amazing stuff. We've got all of that coming up. And of course, the riots in Dublin. We just heard from Doogie Beattie in Dublin expecting more trouble tonight. Another protest plan. And the guard of the police are deploying water cannon in Dublin. We'll have the full update on that. Get in touch all the usual ways. GBviews at gbnews.com. That's all in the next hour. But first, here's your news headlines with Tatiana. Sanchez. Martin, thank you very much. We start with that breaking news. As you've been hearing, 39 Palestinian women and children have been released from Israeli prisons. That was confirmed by Qatar's foreign ministry. It's after the first group of Israeli hostages released by the Hamas terror group arrived in Egypt. These pictures show the hostages being transferred in Red Cross cars via the Rafa crossing a short time ago. There was also a further group of Thai hostages released by Hamas not so long ago following separate mediation efforts by Egypt and Qatar. Those released today include 13 Israelis, some of whom are dual nationals, 10 Thai citizens and a Filipino national. We can take you live now to the Hadzrim Air Base, where that group of Israeli hostages is due to arrive soon. A temporary pause in fighting came into force this morning, which is expected to last for four days. We will, of course, bring you up to date on all of the latest developments. To other news now, 34 people have been arrested after riots and violent scenes in Dublin yesterday. A clean-up was underway this morning in the city centre after cars were set alight and shops were looted. A number of police officers were also injured. The violence was sparked after three children and a woman were stabbed close to a school in the city yesterday. A five-year-old girl is said to be in a serious condition. Taoiseach Leo Varadkar said the people involved in the unrest brought shame on the country. Those involved brought shame on Dublin, brought shame on Ireland, and brought shame on their families and themselves. These criminals did not do what they did because they love Ireland. They did not do what they did because they wanted to protect Irish people. They did not do it out of any sense of patriotism, however warped. They did so because they're filled with hate. They love violence, they love chaos, and they love causing pain to others. 
Oscar Pistorius will be freed from prison on parole in January, nearly 11 years after killing his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, on Valentine's Day in 2013. The former Paralympic champion, who's now 37, claimed that he fired the gun through a bathroom door after mistaking his partner for an intruder, saying he feared for his safety. He was initially jailed for five years, but an appeal saw him sent back for six years in 2016, less than half of the 15-year minimum term that had been sought by prosecutors. Nissan has announced a £1.2 billion plan to build electric versions of two new cars at its Sunderland plant. The Japanese automaker's new electric Qashqai and Duke models will be manufactured at the site. It's also expected to bring a wider investment in the industry, including the construction of a new gigafactory to make more batteries. Rishi Sunak's facing a backlash from senior MPs of his own party after new figures revealed migration is at an all-time high. Reports suggest MPs are demanding action to reduce the number of people coming legally to the UK. Net migration peaked at 745,000 last year, a record high. Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride says measures to reduce the number are already in place. We accept that the figures are too high and that's why, for example, recently we announced that in the case of 150,000 student visas, we'd be clamping down on them, uh, bringing uh, dependents in uh, with them. We're putting up the cost of uh, visas, uh, a number of different measures. And the OBR, who are the independent forecasters uh, who look at the kind of impacts of these steps, recognise that this will uh, in itself start to bring uh, the level of migration down, but there is more to be done. And a familiar face is returning to London's Oxford Street as music shop HMV reopens its doors. The historic retailer returns today after a four-year absence, reclaiming its old flagship location and what's hoped to be a boost for the popular shopping strip. GB News reporter Ray Addison is there. His return to profit means that new owner Doug Putnam has been able to reopen the brand's flagship store four years after it shut down here on Oxford Street. He's going to be hoping that it can once again become a mainstay of the high street. Now, over the years, influential acts such as Michael Jackson, the Spice Girls and the Beatles, no less, have all performed here. It's also been used as an air raid shelter in World War II and burnt to the ground and been rebuilt. Now, it'll have to survive the tough economic conditions as many shoppers tighten their belts. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now back to Martin. Thank you, Tatiana. Well, we start in the Middle East, where several hostages have been released by Hamas as part of a ceasefire deal. The International Red Cross has confirmed that its teams have started carrying out a multi-day operation to facilitate the release and transfer of hostages held in Gaza and of Palestinian detainees. So far, the agency has confirmed that 24 hostages have been released. Well, Major General Chip Chapman, former head of counterterrorism at the Ministry of Defence, joins me now. Chip, always a pleasure to see you on the show. Thank you for joining us. You may have seen those dramatic images of hostages being brought from Gaza um, through the Rafa crossing into Egypt. Incredible images of, of hostages being assisted into vehicles. This marks a hugely positive breakthrough in what's been a very, very bleak few weeks, doesn't it? Well, it's uh, non-combatant immunity should persist in any kind of war. That is that the old, the sick, the young and the infirm should be spared from war. So this is really conflict pause, a humanitarian pause. It is not peace. It is not conflict termination. It is not conflict resolution. And it's certainly not going to be conflict reconciliation. But it does give some space for things to happen in the future. You know, jaw jaw is always better than war war. And of course, there are three groups we're really looking at here of hostages. The first one is these Israeli women and children. Some have been released today. The second is those foreign nationals. And we've heard that uh, 10 Thais and one Filipino have been released. And that's important because there are a significant number of thousands of Thai uh, contract workers in Israel and 31 of them were murdered on the 7th of um, October. But the last one is the group of Israeli soldiers. That is the real leverage for the uh, for Hamas in, in the end, because historically we recall that Gilad Shalit 
uh, one Israeli soldier was uh, exchanged ultimately for a thousand uh, Palestinian prisoners. So it's good in terms of confidence building measures. It doesn't mean that there's a breakthrough in terms of a, uh, a better peace for either side because the Israeli operational objectives, which do include releasing hostages, are still there. And the first one that comes after that is to annihilate Hamas in ethical combat, that is, destroy their military capability for the future. So that is irrefutable that they can't come back and rule Gaza. And Chip, how significant is it that part of the um, counter deal of this was the release of 39 Palestinians held in Israeli prisons? Now, presumably, they're in prison for a good reason, and that is they represent a threat to the Israeli state. What kind of increased risk do you think releasing those people may entail? Well, there's always going to be a quid pro quo in negotiations. And again, I don't think there's essentially that much risk from these people, because again, they are mostly, I think, women and children. Now, the risk comes when you get to the, um, the real denouement of exchanging the Israeli soldiers for those real long-term terrorist operatives who are in uh, Israeli prisons. That becomes the really key factor at the end of the day. And really, there's three things that the Israelis seek to do, of course. And one is that any of their losses must be acceptable in military terms. But the second one is that all their operations must be acceptable to the home front. And the home front really demands in Israel that they do everything they can to release the hostages. So there's always going to have to be this quid pro quo, a trade-off between what is happening between one side and the other. Uh, people won't necessarily like that, but that's just a reality of how these negotiations take place. And Chip, we've spoken before about the ceasefire gives Hamas an opportunity to regroup and maybe to launch counter-offensive. Of course, during the exchange of hostages, that's all dependent upon there not being a resumption of hostilities. But presumably Hamas won't be sitting around playing cards during this time. They'll be regrouping and looking to form a counter-offensive, perhaps. Yeah, I think one of the key things for me of the what we think is in the agreement is that there should be no aerial surveillance drones or uh, Israeli aircraft flying over Gaza. Now, that is important from an Israeli perspective in terms of future targeting. You know, having your eyes and ears over the uh, territory allows you to see what uh, Hamas are doing above ground. And of course, it might be that some of the Hamas leadership actually leave Gaza using the tunnel system to get out through uh, Egypt. And I know that might sound absurd, but uh, rather like uh, in the Second World War, MI9 had sort of escape runs. For those leaders, that might be an opportunity for them to do this, leaving the cannon fodder there, uh, the sort of low-level op operatives, to fight fight the war. Now, that isn't the only capability, of course, for the Israelis. And in their 2021 uh, fight against Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. It was the utilization of their space power allied to uh, um, machine learning and supercomputing, which gave them the uh, ability to target Hamas. So you don't necessarily need aerial surveillance from drones or aircraft. And indeed, that was called the first artificial intelligence war. OK, Chip Chapman, thank you for joining us once again on GB News. Always a pleasure. Now let's cross live now to Tel Aviv, where we are joined by a former member of the Israeli parliament, Dr. Einat Wilf. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Wilf. Superb news for Israel. A very, very emotional moment. Those images of Israeli people, um, hostages being freed and taken on to um, ambulances must be um, a joyous moment for the Israeli public after many weeks of bleak news. It's actually a moment of deeply mixed emotions mm. because there is clearly joy at the people who are returning, grandmothers, children, and their mothers. Um, but there's also a sense of despair that they were kidnapped at all. There's also a sense of loneliness that the world in many ways abandoned Israel to negotiate a release of children and grandmothers. Um, there's a sense of, in, in what world is that okay? Uh, I mean, in a much better world, we would have seen the head of the Red Cross, the Secretary General of the UN, stationed day in, day out on the border of Gaza with Egypt and saying, Israel owes Hamas nothing because Hamas must release those people. 
In what world is it okay to just kidnap children and grandmothers and mothers from their bed on a Saturday morning and keep them as bargaining chips for 47, 50 days? So we're, we're thrilled to see uh, 13 people uh, be released, but we know how many more are still held there. Mm. And we're shocked that people even expect that there should be a negotiation of their release rather than just a clear demand that they be released. Yeah, Dr. Wolf, the images, particularly of elderly and children and women being taken hostage by Hamas, who so brazenly displayed that imagery on social media, horrified and shocked the world. But there has been huge pressure from the international community for a ceasefire, the UN and lots of um, political organisations worldwide. And people might say today, if a ceasefire looks like this, or at least a temporary ceasefire looks like this, there'll be more pressure for a continuation of it. But of course, Benjamin Netanyahu has made it clear he will not stop short until Hamas is eradicated. What's the route forward? It's important to understand that it's Israelis themselves, even more than the prime minister, who are in many ways concerned that by the calls of the world for a ceasefire without making the demands of what will end the war. Because with all due respect, the secretary general of the UN, senior politicians, they're not beauty queens saying that they want world peace. They can't just say, we want a ceasefire. They need to be serious people who say, release all the hostages immediately, unconditionally, disarm Hamas, destroy the tunnels, surrender the perpetrators of the massacre on October 7th to justice, commit to letting go of the destructive ideology of from the river to the sea. Those will not bring back the 1,200 butchered Israelis but they will bring an end to the war. And anyone who just makes beauty queen demands for a ceasefire, rather than serious policy demands for what is required to restore safety, security, peace, they're not serious. And Dr. Wilf, do you um, suspect or fear that Hamas will use this time to regroup and to um, pull the cells back together? Do you expect a change of heart from them or do you expect a resumption of hostilities once this momentary ceasefire has passed? Oh, it's guaranteed that that's what they're going to use it for. As everyone repeatedly said, on October 6, we had a ceasefire. They used the previous ceasefire in order to plan the butchery of October 7th. There is nothing in their declarations which were that October 7th will be repeated again and again and again until all the Jews are dead or gone. Uh, there's nothing in their declarations to lead us to think that there is any uh, change of heart. So it's not something that I suspect. It's something that is guaranteed. They will use the time to continue planning more attacks. They are as committed as ever not to their people, not to building the Gaza Strip as a prosperous place, but to the destructive ideology that it's more important for them that the Jews will not be sovereign in any part next to them. They don't want to build a state for themselves next to Israel. They want whatever they want. They first want to make sure that there is no Israel. OK, Dr. Ainet Will, former member of the Israeli parliament, thank you very much for joining us today on GB News. Much, much appreciated. Now, moving on to the fallout from last night's riots in Dublin after the Republic of Ireland's premier says the hundreds of people involved in violent scenes brought shame on their country. 34 people were arrested in riots that saw buses and trams burn, shops looted and several police vehicles damaged. In the last few minutes, the Irish Justice Minister Helen McEntee has rejected calls from Sinn Féin leader Mary Lou Macdonald to resign following last night's violence. The clashes were triggered by a knife attack on three school children and their care assistants outside a school in the city centre yesterday lunchtime. Well, let's cross now to Dublin and speak to our reporter, Doogie Beatty. So, Doogie, as we move towards another evening, I understand another protest is planned and you brought us some dramatic news of the ramping up of the police activity to counter that. 
Yes, indeed. Uh, it, another protest that is on Twitter now that uh, at 7 o'clock there will be an immigrant protest outside the GPO, the post office, just down the road from me here by me in O'Connell Street. Um, now, that will bring a lot of youths and so forth into this area. There is a lot of Garda, Shia Khanna, or police force, if you like, uh, riot squad uh, sitting off the side streets. Their vans are there. There is a heavy police presence here. And just about 25 minutes ago, uh, some of my colleagues had said to me that they're on their way back north. They had seen the PSNI's water cannon, uh, two of them making their way in towards Dublin. Now, Drew Harris, the current chief constable of the Garda Shia was also a deputy chief constable of the PSNI. So you can only imagine that he has used his contacts there to acquire those water cannon for any public disorder that may happen over the next few weeks here in Dublin. But this has been going on for the guts of two years. Uh, I mean, I'd reported last year on, on uh, protests in the East Wall. And this is because communities here, working class communities, this is the north of Dublin. This is where uh, things like the commitments, those great films and so forth were all made. And of course, those communities now feel under threat. They feel that there is too much immigration too quickly. They're not ever against uh, people coming into their country, but what they do want is they want them security cleared, they want them censored, and, and they really want to know uh, what why, what they, their purpose is in this country. That's not new to Ireland. That's all over the UK. It's right out through Europe. And uh, the political comments that's been made today, uh, you would only imagine if you were Drew Harris, you would think to yourself, well, this hasn't been too helpful for me in the last couple of nights because it's his police officers that will be in the front line of this. Now, from the heavy police presence that, that is here already, you would only imagine that they will be sifting out those people that are coming in here to legally protest and those, of course, that are not. But Dublin is seeing something that hasn't been seen here in decades. In fact, I was just at a hotel a minute ago there to have a cup of tea and there was a band due to play here tonight. And ironically, they said to me, they're not playing here tonight. They're going to go to Belfast. <laughs> because, I mean, to put Belfast is safer than Dublin, you know, it says, it says we're in a sign of the times. But you always find a bit of humour in Ireland amongst uh, the worst of times. Yeah. But the, the locals here are really very much disillusioned with politics here. Not, not disillusioned how they're running lots of, of the country. They're disillusioned about where they fit in in this new Ireland. Uh, and they do feel that their politicians aren't listening to them. And that, more than anything, probably has sparked off the current climate that exists here. OK, Doogie Beatty, thank you for joining us live from Dublin. Yeah, and I tend to agree. I mean, I, I wonder if, if you were called a criminal filled with hate by Louis Vracker, Leo Vracker, beg your pardon, uh, that's going to help calm things ahead of tonight's planned protest, deploying water cannon on the streets of Dublin. Well, let's see what happens. You can get lots more on that story, the riots in Dublin, on our website. And thanks to you, gbnews.com is the fastest growing national news website in the country. It's got breaking news and all the brilliant analysis you've come to expect from GB News, so thank you for helping to make that happen. Now, the Tories have made up ground on Labour in the first opinion poll since Jeremy Hunt's autumn statement. Is this the start of a big Conservative comeback? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, and this is Britain's News Channel. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour, with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. Bellissima. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel.
Well, I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Tired of the usual focus tested, pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 5.26. You're watching or listening to me, Martin Daubney, on GB News. Now, in a few minutes, as Rishi Sunak is urged to clamp down on working visas, I'll ask, can the NHS survive without more foreign workers? But there was one bit of good news for Rishi Sunak today. The Tories have got their best poll rating since September. In the first opinion poll since Jeremy Hunt's awesome statement, the Conservatives got to 25%, and that's up by four points in a week. With me now is the former Labour MP Stephen Pound to go over that. So Stephen, they've had a, a bit of a mini poll boom, but the surprising thing is the, the things that will land the best or what I would call labour policies, well, the, the, the minimum wage yeah. and increase in the state pension. Yeah, I think it's remarkable because I was in the House when the Tories were voting against yeah. the minimum wage and they said the minimum wage would actually drain the lifeblood from British industry. Yeah. But look, for me, I mean, Labour's still 19 points ahead and this is, I think, is a pretty typical example of, you know, up like a rocket and down with the stick. But there's one thing that really, really surprised me about. There's one big gaping hole in this statement. I would have thought, absolutely guaranteed, if there's one thing they would do, is something for the motorist. Yeah. Whether it's a cut in fuel duty, or just, just something, because we all know that the motorists in this country are hurting, we know that they're a very, very powerful voice, and we just have to mention two words, Ux and Bridge, mm. you know, to actually remind people. There's nothing there for it. Yeah, and, and also with the ULES backlash, I say, in Uxbridge, yeah. and, and this wedge issue yeah. of, of, of yeah. rowing back on, on scrapping petrol cars, nothing there. But it's interesting, 85% thought it was a good idea to increase the minimum wage, 78% um, pensions thought it was a good idea, no surprises there, uh, but also increasing welfare benefits in line with inflation. 64% of Tory voters thought that was a good idea. Well, Again, that's something I thought, that they, I almost thought <laughs> that Jeremy Hunt had got Rachel Reeves' notes at one point. Yeah, that would be slightly embarrassing if they picked up the wrong folder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can imagine that. But look, the, the reality is that, they, going right back to Ian Duncan Smith, the, the Tories have been the party of actually trying to control welfare benefits. And if you actually have a look at the statements that were being made by Mel Stride last week, it was all about pay, pay, people are going to have to go back to work, and even if they're physically disabled, they're going to have to work from yeah. home. You know, it was a very, very old-style Tory, hardcore, as you say, wedge issue. Mm. And yet, 
yet they've gone for this when they, if they, as I said, they voted against the minimum wage, they voted you know, um, against uprating benefits in line with the, the three different categories. I, I find it quite extraordinary. Now, it's almost as if they've kind of given up already, but it's what slightly concerns me about this is that I think there is some, some good stuff in there. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and I think in some ways he's been given a wee bit of fiscal headroom, you know, by the and higher than anticipated receipts. But the problem is our debt to GDP ratio, the, the amount of money we owe compared to the amount of money we produce in this country, is mm. about level pegging now. It means we owe as much as the total yeah. of, of our production. Do you think any of this will be enough to give Keir Storm a sleepless night? Or will, will the Labour Party no. feel this is a slight bump, you know, a bit of a dead cat, oh, and it will go down? Yeah. You've been around a long time. Yeah, yeah. Does a four-point yeah. poll yeah. bump yeah. mean anything? Well, it, it means nothing unless, unless it's repeated by the five big polling companies and yeah. it's in double figures. It means nothing. It's a four-point. That, that's ridiculous. But I have to say, there's one thing that we do brilliantly in the Labour Party, and that is we lose elections. We've got form. We're damn good at it. And yes. so if anyone can snatch defeat... But I think in this case, you'd, you'd have to be Houdini uh, to, to escape the, the, the jaws of the electorate that the Tories are facing at the moment. But the Labour Party, by and large, stands back and looks on in horror. But the funny thing is, Martin, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a Labour person, but I'm a patriot first. And I, I never forget the advice that we were always given in the early days in politics. You put your country first, your constituency second, and your party third. From my party's point of view, this is good news. From the country's point of view, I think the debt overhang is now terrifying, and I think we are facing a very, very serious financial situation. And in a nutshell, can the Tories turn this around, or is it simply too far gone? In a two-horse race... You know, you'd think, or you know, it's becoming increasingly three or four horse race now. But the reality is, I don't think they can. Not in the time they've got. They've got to go to the country by the end of next year. That's not long. Okay, Stephen Bowne, thank you for joining us. And also, great tie clip. I forgot mine today. Very it's, it's a tribute to you, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Stephen Bowne. So there's lots more to come between now and six o'clock, including I'll discuss what a crackdown on visas for foreign workers could mean for the NHS. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Martin, thank you. Well, as you've been hearing, 13 Israeli hostages released by Hamas are back in Israel. That's according to the Israel Defence Forces. These pictures show the hostages being transferred in Red Cross cars via the Rafa crossing a short time ago. More aid is being allowed into Gaza, which is expected to continue over the coming days. There was also a further group of Thai hostages released by Hamas following separate mediation efforts by Egypt and Qatar. Those released in today include 13 Israelis, some of whom are dual nationals, 10 Thai citizens and a Filipino national. We can take you live now to the Hatsurim Air Base, where that group of Israeli hostages is due to arrive soon. Qatar's foreign ministry says 39 Palestinian women and children have also been released from Israeli prisons as part of the deal. A temporary pause in fighting came into force this morning, which is expected to last for four days. We will, of course, bring you more on this story as we get it. To other news now, 34 people have been arrested after riots and violent scenes in Dublin yesterday. A clean-up's been underway in the city centre after cars were set alight and shops were looted. A number of police officers were also injured. The violence was sparked after three children and a woman were stabbed close to a school in the city yesterday. A five-year-old girl is said to be in a serious condition. And Nissan has announced a £1.2 billion plan to build electric versions of two new cars at its Sunderland plant. The Japanese automaker's new electric Qashqai and Juke models will be manufactured at the site, which expected to protect jobs and generate new employment in the sector. For more on all of those stories, you can visit our website, gpnews.com. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2599 and €1.1525. The price of gold, £1,588.12 per ounce. And the FTSE 100s closed at 7,488 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report.
And thank you, Tatiana. Now, Rishi Sunak is under more pressure from angry Tory MPs after yesterday's record net migration figures. They revealed that the population of the UK increased by almost three quarters of a million last year. Sweller Braverman said the figures were a slap in the face to the British public. Well, I'm joined now by a political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris, so Jacob Rees-Mogg issued a dramatic apology last night on GB News saying, I'm sorry for failing to hit immigration targets. The, the new Conservatives say it's do or die. Um, each of us made a promise to the electorate, and we don't believe that such promises can be ignored. The Telegraph today, one of your columnists, Alison Pearson, saying the betrayal of the British people is complete. The Conservative Party, Conservative voters, tearing themselves apart over this issue. An apology issue. is overdue for the Tory party. They, mm. they uh, of course, the party put, put into power almost on the back of that Brexit vote in 2016. The referendum, in, uh, the very big landslide in 19 was built on that referendum yep. vote to control our borders and our laws. They haven't controlled our borders. I mean, forget mm. uh, the difficult situation with stop the boats, yep. uh, the boats across the, the, the channel. This is on their watch. And it's through the front door, not through the, through the cat door, flap. Not, yeah, not, <laughs> not the cat flap. The cat flap is small boats. The front door, mm. wide open. In they mm. come. Numbers up. 1.2 million in two years. Now, what's interesting right now, breaking this hour, is a, a, an article here from Boris Johnson, a former Prime mm. Minister. He's written it in the Daily Mail, saying these numbers are way, way too big, to which I would add, well, they have it on your watch, Boris, mm. but let's move on from that. Way, way too big. People will not accept demographic change at this kind of pace, he says. Look what's happening in Dublin, Johnson says. Well, that lovely and happy city is engulfed by race riots, mm. or seems to be engulfed by race riots. This is Boris Johnson tonight. He's saying the whole point of Brexit is that we have, we are not, we can do what we like. We have the powers to sort it out. And that's yeah. what's so irritating for, for a lot of people who voted Tory back in the back in nineteen. You have the powers, sort it out. Mm. Now Johnson's idea here is to lift the income needed to get a visa from around twenty-six thousand pounds a year to forty thousand pounds a year to cut off to stop allowing so many to come through. I also know that what is in the offing in government is some movement on dependence, so you're not yeah. going to allow to bring in so many family members with your visa in future. I mean, because that was a huge part. Yesterday, student visas, 378,000, up 58,000, plus 96,000 dependents. A lot of people saying, Chris, this is being abused as a way of buying your way into Britain, and 65% of those students are now staying on. Another thing, as you mentioned there, was skilled labour, which brings us on to the question of NHS workers. Yeah. So another issue where it's kicked off, if you raise that threshold to 45,000, that will get rid of a lot of those nurses that we're currently importing from Nigeria, from India, from the Philippines. And so therefore, the next argument is, can the NHS function without that? And if uh, not, why aren't we training our own British nurses? Well, why aren't we? And that well, it goes back to this age-old debate in politics, British jobs for British workers. It was mm. kicked off by Gordon Brown in the late noughties. Really further in this article by, um, by Boris Johnson, he says, no wonder so many millions of, of Brits are skiving on mm. benefits or sick pay and won't take those jobs on which you all depend. Language is getting stronger. You know, skiving is a real, is a real dog whistle term, it is, I think. Yeah. Used here by Boris Johnson in the, in the Daily Mail in tomorrow's newspaper. Um, people won't like that, but I think there's a feeling on the right of the Tory party to start cracking down on this number because it's too big and it's not acceptable to have five million people on benefits who aren't at work then tackle that number. They tried, didn't they, in the, in the um, autumn statement this week. Mel Stride, the working pension secretary, is trying to do measures to work from home if you're on benefits. You, know, you might lose your bus pass. But it's quite, it's, it's maybe not as strong as some Tory MPs want it to be. But then it begs the question, um, 2.6 million on long-term disability, that's doubled since the pandemic, yet the four-point poll bump we've seen the Tories land today is because they're saying let's have bigger benefits, let's increase the minimum wage. So it seems like the, the, the more socialist, the more Labour <laughs> policies are landing well. Boris calling people skivers, it, it might not land well with the middle ground. It may not, and that, that bounce could also be because, because of the tax cuts and the indication of future to future tax cuts to come. I mean, it was a good, you know, the minimum wage went up, didn't it, by a pound or so. Um, we saw the increase in the state pension and benefits too, using the higher level from September inflation rate, not October. So perhaps that might, yeah, but, but someone's going to pay for this somehow. I mean, th this situation does not feel tenable. The one good thing in Tories have got going for themselves is that Labour have no better answer. Mm. Labour's answer is, well, on Stop the Boats is it may be to have quotas of migrants being passed around Europe, possibly, but there's no answer on the net migration figure. 
Companies love it, the treasury like it for growth. It puts a lot of pressure on communities. And our viewers, people out there, can't get their appointment in the, in the doctors. Mm. It, it, it worries them. Chris O with news that Boris has waded in. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. And to discuss whether the NHS can survive without migration is same-day doctor GP Lawrence Gurlis. Welcome to the show, Lawrence. Thank you very much for joining us. So we're just talking there about the number of skilled visa applications. Um, it is 322,000, up 87,000, and including 154,000 dependents. And, of course, a tranche of that, a large tranche, are people coming in to work for the NHS. So the question is, can the NHS survive without importing nurses and doctors from abroad? Or should we actually be training British nurses and doctors up in the first place instead? Well, I know a lot of foreign medical and nursing graduates are upset by this debate and feel that they're being unfairly singled out. And we do depend a lot on, on overseas trained staff um, to run the health service. I always think it's unfair to steal staff from poorer countries. Um, look, if the population's increased, I'm not political at all, but if the population's increased, we've got to improve the infrastructure. The problem, as I see it, is we're asking the wrong questions. We should be doing better at retaining staff, staff retention, mm -hmm. so we don't have to replace them so often. There's a terrible shortage of GPs, but in fact, hospital staff, number of hospital doctors is 30% up on 10 years ago. Um, but we're less efficient, they're less productive, and not because they're lazy, because the health service is just is 75 years old, and it functions like a, like a car would if it was 75 years old. It just doesn't work. So in answer to your question, can we sustain the NHS? I don't think we can sustain the NHS anyway. I think it's broken and has been for a long time. Uh, and to some extent, I think the, the public should be calling um, for a change rather than just saying more funding, more funding, let's make it work. Because you and I know if you throw money at the health service, it's not going to make any difference. And so, of course, relying on imported labour for the NHS, you're saying is a sticking plaster solution. What kind of root and yeah, branch reform not... would you like to see then instead? What I'd like to see uh, is the sort of system they have in Australia, Germany and France. Now, now I know that that's anathema to a lot of people because it involves social insurance. It does provide a safety net for the elderly and for people who cannot afford to take out insurance and cannot afford to pay. It can be run as a fair, equitable system. But every time I mention this, people talk about, well, it increases inequality. And, and there is no will within the general public, or certainly even within the political parties, to make such a radical change. It frustrates me that we cannot do anything really radical in, in this country, is even when it's something to improve the lives of everyone. I mean, just to give you an example, Martin, to start off, I, my own personal hobby horse, you know, 90% of prescriptions in this, in this country are dispensed free of charge. Um, despite, you know, although some people are exempt, it's, there's widespread fraud and medicine cabinets all over the country are full of expensive medicines that are going to waste. That's just one example of how we run this thing and we run it badly. But of course, Lawrence, um, those from the political left, certainly the Labour Party, would say um, if we stopped importing nurses and doctors, the NHS would simply collapse. Are you, are you saying that's going to happen irrespective of that? Well, to say, yes, I think, I think the NHS is collapsing now. And we're coming into December. And as you know, there'll be a, another winter crisis. There's bound to be. There's going to be probably a flu epidemic. Um, people forget that actually quite a lot of staff take their holidays over Christmas. It's never mentioned when we see the, the you know, the, the bed crisis over Christmas. It's actually one of the reasons for that is huge numbers of staff take annual leave at the same time. And it becomes a sort of Christmas Day service for two weeks, in effect. Um, so, yes, I think the health service is failing anyway. If we retained our staff better, we wouldn't need to steal them from other countries. And as you said, Stealing those staff, it's just, it doesn't solve the problem. It just puts the problem off for another day. We need to reform the health service. And, and I asked the public to ask for it. We're never going to get the politicians to do this. We're never going to get the medical profession to do this. It, I, should, I think the public should be demanding a reform. You know, Lawrence, one thing that always intrigues me is how we're always um, accused of imperialism or empire if we take things from abroad and bring them back to Britain. Yet... 
The Liberals, those on the political left, need to have no such compunction when we are taking the finest trained medical staff from, from India, from Nigeria, from the Philippines, from Thailand, and bringing them to Britain, and therefore, by dint of you know, logic, depleting those countries of the best health care for their citizens. Exactly so, Martin, and no one ever asked that particular question. And you will know that for every medical school place, there are probably six or seven applications in the UK, but we turn away bright, ambitious young students who want to be doctors because we don't provide enough training places for medical students, because it's actually cheaper to import uh, doctors from third world countries and to train them ourselves. And, and that's been the case for as long as I've been a doctor, which, as you can imagine, is quite a long time. You know, we just don't train enough doctors and we should. We should be doing that. And we should be training our own staff. Yeah. I think a lot of people agree with that. Same day, Dr. GP. Lawrence Gurlis, thank you very much for joining us on GB News. A breath of fresh air. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, Nigel Farage has given a couple of his campmates the bums rush in the I'm a Celebrity Jungle. Yes, the GB News presenter has been caught having a bath with his backside in full view. There's a full moon down under. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, and this is Britain's News Channel. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. <laughs> Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> I'm not sure. To join me, Nana Aquir, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday, where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, well, it, you... <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's on your teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Coming next time on the Dinosaur Hour. Oh! <laughs>
<laughs> I'd never heard a bomb go off before I went to Belfast. I could hardly spell Kalashnikov. <laughs> I didn't know what, what that word meant. And here was I thrown into this situation. We were one of the most, possibly the most progressive, racially tolerant countries in the world. One other question. Will you shut up? Yes. <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. Sundays on GB News. Welcome back. It's 5.49. You're watching or listening to me, Martin Daubney, on GB News. Now, if you've been watching I'm a Celebrity this year, you may have seen a different side to our own very own Nigel Farage. I just see something I've never thought I'd see. Nigel's have you seen that? bare arse. I've seen it on the first day. <laughs> <laughs> it's in early, early 60, and too bad. He looks good, doesn't he? <laughs> Superb. Now joining me is showbiz reporter Steph Tatchy. Steph, so not once but twice now we've seen the full moon down under, as they're calling it, the full farage, prime British beef coming out. Seems to have gone down rather well in the jungle. <laughs> Indeed, Martin. It seems like Nigel is becoming Mr. Bumtastic in the jungle. You know, usually on I'm Celeb, it's all about the women and they usually have this white bikini moment in the shower. But this year, it seems social media and viewers at home are a bit obsessed with Nigel Farage bearing it all down under. Before these celebrities go on the show, Martin, they sign an agreement with bosses and they say what they don't want to appear on TV. And it appears that maybe Nigel didn't read the small print because they seem to be having a bit of fun showing his, um, his buttocks live on TV. So, so Steph, um, it's the second time he's done it. Do you think it's a part of his game plan? Because, of course, he was saying the other night, you know, I want to get the challengers because I end up getting 25% of the airtime. That seems to have backfired. So when that backfired, he's ro rolling out the backside. Well, he knows that is going to be a talking point, both good and bad. And if, if the thing is, it's going to get him airtime, and it works both ways. You know, in a sense, you have to kind of get seen. And if this is what's going to work for Nigel for now, I think it will give him more airtime. But tonight, we will see him take part in a Bush Tucker trial called the Touchdown of Terror trial, where he will be playing American football with the rest of his team to try win stars to have some meals on camp tonight. Right now, he's sleeping on the floor because they lost last night's challenge so he's sleeping in snake rock so i can imagine nigel might be having a bit of a dodgy back after sleeping on the floor last night but we have to see how he'll do tonight and are we expecting any sparks from the new arrivals and uh, one of them the boxing fella he's been very outspoken about his um, disdain for brexit and for nigel do you think we're going to see the sparks fly there and probably actually that will help nigel to get more airtime because it'll kick off again I predict a riot, Martin, indeed. Uh, Tony Belly is not someone who holds his tongue, so I can imagine once him and Nigel have a bit of one-on-one -on -one time, the B-word's going to come out again. But you know what I've loved about Nigel so far in this series? He's kept his calm, he's kept his cool, so no matter who he's talking to, whether he's talking to a fierce Remainer such as Nella Rose, he can handle his whoever comes his way. So I think Tony will have his moment with Nigel, especially as they're on the same team tonight. So we're going to have to watch how these two get on. Thank you, Steph. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you very much for that latest update on the rumble in the jungle. Now, sight for sore eyes, just hoved into view, <laughs> because Bev Turner has joined me in the studio. You're standing in for... we transitioning into Michelle Juby tonight for Jube I am identifying as Michelle tonight, Martin, just Thanks. for one hour while um, she's off doing something more important on a Friday night. Good. We've got a couple of minutes at the end of this show to talk about what's on your menu. Well, we are going to be looking at... Um, Starting with these hostages, mm. this swap today, these stunning pictures. If you're just coming in mm. the door from work, then um, you want to stick around to watch this. And there are various groups establishing themselves here in the UK now, calling for peace vigils on all sides, which we haven't really seen. We've seen so much division. Yeah. And so we're just talking about whether that is that remotely possible at the moment. Tensions feel incredibly high, which is going to lead us on to events in Ireland yesterday. Yeah. Obviously, the awful stabbing that happened during Michelle's show uh, yesterday evening. And we just want to know why the reaction was such. I'm going to be contemplating what is it about those people who are being described as 
far right. Yeah. I want to talk about what that even means, whether my panel have a, a clear definition of what that is. Um, you know, what, why are they being pushed to those limits? What is it about their life which means they are carrying out this destructive, mindless, pointless violence on the streets of Dublin? Well, they're angry. Which achieved, and of Ireland, which has achieved nothing, really. And we spoke to Doogie Beatty uh, moments ago. He's in Dublin and they're deploying the water cannon ahead of tonight's um, second protest. So it's probably going to kick off again. Yeah. And I think, Bev, these people felt they haven't been listened to. A million immigrants have gone into Ireland over these past few years. They haven't had a voice. And when they complain, they've become called far right. Mm. They've been called racist. And I think that's a fantastic debate yeah. you've got coming up ahead tonight. Because the response has quite rightly been from Leo Varadkar, the, the, the Taoiseach of Ireland, has quite rightly been to condemn this violence. Yeah. And that's right. But in doing that, they're failing to ask the question as to why it's happening in the first place. So that, And also, why is the contract between schools and parents completely broken down? Well, that sounds fantastic. Thank you. I've been here all week. I've loved it. But next is Jubes & Co with Bev Turner. Don't miss it. Hello, welcome to your latest GB News weather update from the Met Office. There'll be more sunny spells to come this afternoon. It'll stay dry for many, but tonight is going to be a cold one. We've got this Arctic air that's been pushed in around this high pressure behind this cold front. And it's also bringing some quite strong northerly winds to eastern coast. Those winds should slowly start to ease throughout tonight. It'll be a calmer day tomorrow here. But away from those winds in the east, in the west, it's going to be a clear and dry night and a cold one as well. Temperatures will drop quite quickly this evening to be in a sort of very cold place by Saturday morning. As low as minus five, possibly possibly minus six in northwestern England, southwestern Scotland by tomorrow morning. So a crisp start to the weekend. It will be a sunny start, though, apart from along the far east, where we have got the risk of a few showers still continuing parts of Norfolk and Suffolk into Saturday afternoon. But most of these showers should be fairly isolated. So plenty of sunshine to be had, but still feeling quite chilly. So you will need a couple of layers, eight or seven degrees at max away from the wind. Then on Sunday, we start to see some